please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Sherilyn, will you call the roll, please? Council members Lennon? Here. Martin? Here. Polica? Here. Piana? Here. Mayor Coulter? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum this evening. Our next item of business would be the approval of the agenda. What's council's pleasure on the agenda this evening? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to request we add presentations for Ferndale Public Schools, and I'd like to request we make that presentation B between WFRN and the Downtown Development Authority. Very good. So noted. I support. Any other additions or changes to the agenda this evening? Is there a motion? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I move to uh, accept the agenda as pres uh, with the changes noted. Support. Uh, moved by Piana, supported by Pollocka. Any discussion? Sherilyn, could you call the roll? Council members Lennon? Yes. Martin? Yes. Pollocka? Yes. Piana? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes. Thank you. The agenda is adopted. Uh, moving on now to presentations. And our first presentation uh, is a very special one for us here at Council because we get to recognize two people who you never get to see even though they're at every City Council meeting because they're back there running all the equipment and they do an outstanding job and they do it as volunteers. And so uh, if Charlene is listening <laughs> and Charles, we'd like to embarrass you for a moment. Oh, there they are, so come on out, come on out. <laughs> Did they tell you we were doing this? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, you look so nice. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You're right. Um, so as I mentioned to the audience, you guys are here every meeting, although they never get a chance to see you because you're back there um, working very hard on the to make sure all the equipment works. And if you're watching at home, these are the folks that make that possible. We couldn't literally broadcast our meetings without both of you, and we are very indebted to your service. So let me embarrass you for a minute by reading this nice proclamation. Honoring Charlene and Charles, I, I believe they're both worded the same. We'll just put you both in there. For your many years of service to WFRN-TV, the city's cable television station, I, Mayor David Coulter, on behalf of the Ferndale City Council, extend the city's appreciation to Charlene and Charles Font for their many years of service to WFRN-TV, our cable television station. They embody the ideal of volunteerism, always going above and beyond to provide assistance during the live broadcast of city council meetings. Their commitment to excellence has been a great ben benefit to the station and to the city. Oh, they are a little different. So Charlene, I have to look at you at this one. Charlene and her late husband John not only volunteered at the station themselves, but also instilled their belief in the importance of giving back to the community and to their three children, Charles, Michael, and Arian, who have all volunteered at WFRN-TV throughout the years with unwavering dedication. Charlene's time and energy has been a valuable asset to Ferndale's television station. She is a credit to this community and this organization, and it is with our heartfelt appreciation that we celebrate your achievement. So let me... So here's the part that's different about yours. <laughs> um, Cal has volunteered at the station along with his parents, John and Charlene, as well as his siblings, Michael and Ariane. This strong sense of family and community are qualities not often seen anymore. WFRN TV is very fortunate to have Cal, who embodies the very spirit of volunteerism. The rest is the same, but our appreciation is just as strong. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> no comment. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunities. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Um, the new presentation item B is an uh, update on the public schools, and I believe um, our our board of Trustees member Amy Butters is here to do that. Good evening. 
I'm Amy Butters. I'm a member of the Ferndale School Board. I've got lots of visual aids here for you, so you might have to bear with me. Um, I would just like to update you on a few of the great things that are happening in the Ferndale schools. Up on the screen, we've got some pictures from some recent events. The one that's up there right now is from our extravaganza, which was, well, okay, I'm not going to be able to <laughs> talk as fast as the pictures are going. So the extravaganza was uh, an, event, an annual event that we had at the Ferndale High School gym, and it featured performances of the choirs, the bands, and the orchestras from grades four and up. Plus, there were singers from Roosevelt Primary and also the Ferndale Independent Percussion, which is formerly known as the Winter Line. It's kind of the winter marching band component of our music program. And they all performed, and also there was a display of student art from throughout the district and science projects from Ferndale Middle School. And it was a really fantastic day. It was. It had to be rescheduled because of the snow, and so we were a little worried, but it was still a great turnout, and it was a really great day. Also up on the screen, um, this is our student from Ferndale High School, Nathaniel Brisson Fast, who signed a national letter of intent, uh, it's been a few weeks ago now, to play football with Central Michigan um, in the fall. And he plans on studying the fields of athletic training or teaching while he's at Central Michigan, and so we're very proud of Nate. And then also up on the screen are pictures from our ceremony that we had at the Digital Learning Center. <clears throat> we had, because of the nature of that program, it's an independent, more of an independent study program, and so there are kids that are graduating, you know, in the middle of the year. And so we had a, a commencement ceremony for 34 kids who received their high school diplomas. That was on January 5th. There's the picture from, from that event. It was really, it's always a really great event to see those graduates. So that's a, that's a little bit of what's been going on um, in the past. One other um, past event that I want to be sure and highlight is our um, advocacy trip, which we had on February 19th. I know at least a few of you were there for the, for the picture and rally that we had at Ferndale High School. Um, to, to uh, show support for our group that traveled to Lansing that day to advocate for better funding of our schools. And it was a fantastic day. Um, my colleague on the board, Karen Toomey, and also Kevin Deegan Krauss, spent a lot of time organizing that trip, and it was a, it was a huge success. And, um, and we're, we're very happy to say that we have these flags available for purchase. Uh, these fund are for your car. <laughs> fund our schools, and these are available for purchase, so please get in touch with me if you'd like one of these. these this is a way for us to spread the word about um, our advocacy. And this is not, a, this is not over. Our ad advocacy um, effort is continuing past the trip that we took. Um, specifically, there's a committee called the External Relations Committee, which is part of the school board, who is, they are working on all of these efforts. And I would like to invite everyone, if you are interested, to go to uh, their meetings, which are on the first Monday of every month. The next one will be April 7th at 7 o'clock over at Harding. So we encourage you to, um, to join us in that effort. Who is on that committee? Karen Toomey and Kevin Deegan Krause oh, okay. are heading that up. And then we've got, are there any, is there anyone here that's on the committee? I know we've got lots of community members that are participating. We've got teachers. We've got some municipal leaders that are, are um, helping us out. So it's, it's a nice range of people that are, that are joining that effort. Um, let me check my notes here. Okay. So looking ahead now, I just want to talk about a couple of things. First, this is our poster for our Ferndale High School musical this year, Thoroughly Modern Millie. And that's coming, that's coming up. Um, March 22nd is opening the opening day for that. And there, you're going to start seeing lawn signs pop up for that show. I did stop over yesterday to pop, just peek a little bit at some of the set construction and some of the costumes are going to be fabulous for this show. And I know the music is going to be great. All the kids are learning how to tap dance. And so I know, I know there's some fans. Who, where did I see? I know she's a big fan, right? Yes. <laughs> so um, be sure and get your tickets. There's, 
any number, they'll be available at the door. Or you can ch check out the Ferndale Schools website, or um, there's any number of the kids that are involved with the show that you can purchase tickets from, too. So and it'll be performed in the newly remodeled auditorium, Absolutely. which is beautiful be our, if you haven't seen our it. Our first musical in our newly remodeled yeah. auditorium with the new lights and the new sound system and the new, you know, everything with the new curtain, everything will look really nice. And so that's, that's going to be very exciting. Yeah. All right, last, my last plug, <clears throat> I am a member of the Ferndale School Board, but I am also a member of the Ferndale Education Foundation, and that is separate from the school district. It's a fundraising organization, <clears throat> and this Friday is our big fundraiser. <clears throat> it's a Roaring Twenties, Putting on the Ritz, Dinner and Auction. And it's going to be a great evening. It's happening this Friday from 6 to 10 p.m. at the Club Venetian. And we're going to have some of the kids from Thoroughly Modern Millie are going to be there to perform. There's going to be some other, I think, orchestra kids and some dancers. And we are going to have lots and lots of silent auction items. And the Ferndale business community has, you know, come through for us every year. And this is not an exception. They have really come through with lots and lots of great silent auction items. Plus, we will have a live auction. Our auctioneer this year is Terry Paris, who many of you may remember from, he used to be the Ferndale Patch reporter here in Ferndale, and so he's going to be our auctioneer. And of course, the big finale of the event is the raffle drawing, which is a $5,000 grand prize. So if anyone needs raffle tickets, I've got them here. They're $10 a piece. I'm pretty sure I have the winning one here, so <laughs> be sure and let me know if you if you need to be um, if you need to be set up with some auction, with some raffle tickets. Okay, I think that's it. Our Excellent. next school board meeting is Monday, March 24th at seven. Other questions of Amy? I have one, but it's a little bit off the beaten path. Amy, has there been any discussions uh, about the Ferndale High uh, baseball season? Not that I'm aware look, of. Uh, what I what did well. I did hear that you know that along with much, much other schools, of course, are, it might be in jeopardy. Um, I have not heard of anything. Of yeah, I haven't heard of any um, of any issues involving. But I'll I'll uh, definitely ask around and, and get back to you on that because okay. I imagine it is something that's on oh, yeah. people's minds. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Amy. Uh, all right. Our next uh, and final presentation is the uh, D Downtown Development Authority's 2013 Market Analysis Report. And Christina, you're going to present that tonight. Yeah. It should be right on there. I saw him put it on there. Yeah. All right, uh, in oops, 2013, uh, the Ferndale DDA uh, did uh, conduct its market analysis. This has been um, uh, a while since we've actually conducted a market analysis. The last time was in 2005 and 2006. Um, we have done small updates along the way, but um, not a full um, overall market analysis. Um, tonight, I'll go over our business development goals. Uh, the market analysis overview, the recommendations from the market analysis, and really how we're going to apply these uh, recommendations, uh, which is more like the art and science um, of uh, business development. And uh, last but not least, how we can team together between the city and the DDA to accomplish these, these goals. Top goals for the Business Development Committee and for the organization itself are to strengthen the business mix in the downtown, encourage mixed use uh, development and density, including office and living space, which will help to strengthen our businesses, especially our daytime office, uh, daytime um, traffic, increase parking availability, and promote the ease of the parking system. And those all tie back into improving uh, businesses' bottom lines. 
as well as increasing the number of stores that patrons visit during a visit. The surveyed area extended beyond our tax increment financing boundaries. It went through our entire DDA boundaries. This was different from years past, so we really couldn't be comparing apples to apples when you're looking at um, previous market analysis. And if you compare our census data of the population in Ferndale compared to our trade area that I'll show you a, a map on uh, in the next slide, uh, the trade area is defined by the visitors who are surveyed and where they live. The median age there is 42.3, which compared to the city itself is 35.6. So you'll see that our um, age group is a little bit higher there, as well as the household income. And the trade area covers 23 zip codes. This is the trade area. And patrons surveyed, you'll see that 41% are between the ages of 25 and 54, uh, whereas 34% are between the ages of 45 to 64. Also, in terms of ethnicity, uh, the comparable between the trade area uh, and those surveyed was interesting as well. Uh, African American was actually down in terms of those who were surveyed um, compared to the trade area. So, which which um, shows you that we have um, an opportunity there to penetrate that market a little bit further. So I'm sorry if I'm reading that correctly. Mm -hmm. About 43% of the patrons downtown that were surveyed were African American. Is, am I reading that correct? Currently, in the, our no. No, 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 no. Um, it compared to the trade area, uh, oh. uh, white is 64 oh, and surveyed, and 43 in the trade area. Whereas those surveyed, 21.3 is African American that were surveyed, and 49.6. Um, actually live in the trade area. Gotcha. Okay. So it shows that you have that gap that you can actually try to go and market um, to African American audience a little bit stronger there. Uh, another clip of our trade area, breaking down our, our trade area based on dining, shopping, uh, and working trade areas as, as well. And then in terms of trip purpose, uh, one thing I wanted to point out is with the survey this year, uh, we were really focusing in on that daytime traffic. So 11 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, trying to get a good feel for what people are currently doing so we can really grow that daytime audience. Uh, so you'll see a significant amount um, went towards shopping and dining and entertainment. Um, and when you compare it to our occupation as well, we found some really um, interesting facts in terms of creative professionals. 33.8% are creative prof professionals, well, um, while 29.2% are super creative professionals. So uh, Can you it shows the you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the difference between super creative and <laughs> creative? <laughs> super creative. And those are um, based on um, psychographics. So it would be someone who would probably be more in the arts field, um, more specifically, um, as opposed to a creative professional. Could be someone who uh, works within maybe a marketing or advertising agency, but isn't necessarily a super, super creative person creating art themselves. Does that make sense? More of a professional. Self-employed over. Yes. <laughs> Not self-employed? <laughs> and, and we can give you more of the information on the psychographics and how that breaks out. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, nice to see that there is a significant um, group that are creative or creative plus <laughs> that we can pull from. And I think in terms of uh, our working class, that's really showing you that we have very, very much a, a creative um, base that is here uh, living, working, and in this trade area. So in terms of recommendations, and I'm going to quickly go through these because I know um, we're um, uh, for a little bit of time here, uh, is that we are going to be looking at launching a campaign for millennials, uh, penetrating that audience a little bit further. I think Ferndale is known for being um, a youthful market, but it is interesting to show that those um, age demographics are pointing the fact that we're getting a little bit older and we need to re refocus and make sure that we're targeting uh, the younger patrons um, as we grow. Uh, also, attracting, le attracting uh, leakages 
that are going into the Detroit market um, or east and west markets. So making sure that we're creating some synergies along the way. So um, to look at that for the city and the DDA to team together on is really building upon that east-west connectivity with our communities that neighbor, uh, neighbor us and building the continuity along the strip as well as um, adding live work sections to our websites, uh, which we currently um, both do not have, um, offer affordable housing options for our younger audience, attract businesses that appeal to the millennials, and uh, make sure that our connection with Detroit and the Woodward Corridor um, really highlights our um, successes and how we create the, uh, or support the creative uses along the corridor. We're also looking at creating a uh, comprehensive cross-promotional program uh, that would include uh, retailers and restaurants. This would help to increase the number of visits um, a patron, uh, number of stops a patron has during a visit. Uh, we did see that go down compared to previous studies, so this is something we, we definitely want to focus on. So cross-promoting through our website and Facebook, uh, offering text message sign-ups uh, to residents for downtown Ferndale, as well as downtown Ferndale businesses can offer rewards to city employees, and vice versa, city, the city could offer employees incentives for shopping and living in town. Office recommendations, some of the things that we looked at this year that was different with this study is that we did focus on what, what can we do with office. In previous studies we did not look at this, um, but we felt this is very important for growing our business base. Uh, so what was recommended was 20 to 30,000 square feet of Class A office space, which is supportable. Um, and looking at upper story central business district development as well as main floor C2 area development. Um, and although the market might be a little bit soft, we are obviously seeing signs of growth um, in that and interest, uh, especially in Ferndale, given our agenda later. Um, mm -hmm. And also looking at identifying buildings for conversions, um, working on public private partnerships, attracting creative uses together, and incentivization. So our build program serves, serves as an incentive for the DDA, but also we can look at building codes and zoning flexibility, as well as uh, potential parking discounts to, to help and assist office space. Uh, retail and restaurant recommendations, 12 to 15,000 retail um, clothing and accessories, 10 to 13,000 square feet of restaurant and entertainment, and 9 to 12,000 of general merchandise and <coughs> discount um, stores. So when we applied some of this information, and we're looking at the entire market of the DDA area, uh, we do need to strengthen our existing businesses and, and their market position. Build more awareness of their existing of their of the existing businesses and what they really offer in their niches. What we are finding is that some of the restaurants that were that were being uh, recommended uh, for the downtown were businesses that we have already offering those products. So it might be building awareness or building um, building up quality in that respect. Also assisting businesses in expanding um, in the downtown or improving their product line. So coinciding with that first one, attracting a compatible national anchor to draw large volume and support entrepreneurs in very key areas. And we have to be very sensitive towards this, looking at it geographically and financially. Uh, and as mentioned before, increasing our daytime uses, uses with office development and marketing to current daytime tenants. Other things would include restaurant types um, in terms of restaurants that could be brought into the entire DDA area, looking at our expanded district of the DDA, um, but also the types themselves. Make sure that they're high quality and original, something that isn't already in the market, um, as well as um, using them as a catalyst for the district ends. General merchandise, um, although it might be supportable, um, as, as a whole, uh, we do want to focus that at our district ends, as well as within the central business dis district, look at growing our comparable retail shopping and competitive retail shopping. 
And last but not least, I think is uh, when you look at these growths and the potential for new development in the area, you always have to maintain and manage a marketable and leasable rate within our district. Um, one, to remain competitive, but two, to, re to keep our character of our downtown um, and the community that we really love. So with that, cool. that was it. I know. Yeah. Your best. Um, <laughs> excellent. Um, some questions of Christina. Well, I have a couple, I guess. Um, there's some really good data in there, both demographic and, and strategic data. Um, is there plans to share that with the with the downtown business owners? Some of that I could see could be immediately relevant, and some just so that they're aware of it. But uh, you have a is there a strategy to, to share that with them? And yeah, we do, them? we do have the summary sheet that just helps to kind of synthesize that down, which was included in your packet. That will go out to businesses, um, as well as be available for businesses who are looking to come into the area and out to um, developers and um, also our property owners so that they have a better understanding of what we're looking for uh, within the downtown area. As for the businesses in terms of uh, either product development or market niches and, and making sure that we're helping and assisting them to support their uh, market penetration, it would be identifying some of those businesses and working with them independently on that, okay. um, for sure. Um, are you done? I, one, one other question. Um, a question I get all the time is, well, it's more like a statement. You know what we really need? We need a place that sells this. Or why don't you guys get more places that do this, that, or the other thing? And I try to explain that while we can encourage certain things, you know, um, there, there, there's limitations. These, this is free enterprise, and a landlord can lease to who they like. But talk just a little bit, because I hear this a lot, about what kinds of things that the DDA can do, the city can do, uh, through these kinds of studies or otherwise, to help, help encourage and incentivize or meet some of these goals, which, mm -hmm. you know, really need to be done in partnership with, with the building owners and others. Right. I mean, first and foremost, it does start off with the relationship building, um, making sure that your property owners um, are, one, aware of you and um, that they have a, a better understanding of what you're looking for. Um, it's educating them as well, because many of them, um, uh, this isn't their expertise. They own a building, um, mm -hmm. and they want to fill it. And a lot of times uh, they want to fill it fast because they want the income. And it's uh, working not only with them but also the local brokers that might be uh, supporting them in terms of uh, leasing out space uh, so that they understand the value in waiting for uh, one of the best tenants for that space. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, your highest – your highest and best income use may, might not always be the highest and best use for the district. Um, and uh, a great example of that is actually where Modern Natural Baby, Baby and Painting with a Twist came in and really working with that property owner and identifying that this was a very large building in our downtown and that uh, filling that size space would be very challenging and would probably bring in something that we did not want to see within the downtown area. So encourage, we really encourage them to break up that building um, and uh, make it into smaller uses, which makes it more compatible for retail space. And that is a lot of times the, the biggest challenge. Can, how can you get them to that point? Build funds help, um, but they aren't always the end all that be all, especially when you're looking at that type of uh, building square footage potentially. Um, but also flexibility in our zoning laws um, and, uh, and looking for new ways to incentivize them. Um, and although I might not have a, a great example right now, but I think that one thing that you can look at is um, your your parking in your downtown area. If you were to say ever to implement some um, other form of central business district pay in, payment in lieu of program, you might want to say incentivize for retail space compared to another type of use potentially. Um, and also I think that when you're looking at the overall site plans as for your planning commissions, um, you know, they have to factor in um, a lot of times it would be parking, trees, all those elements that really make the environment work well together. Um, 
But I think that uh, when you're looking at working with a property owner, you start with the, the basis of the information, build that relationship, and hopefully over time you make them make some small adjustments and changes. Ultimately, you have a zoning ordinance in place. You are allowed, as a business, if you are zoned for it, you are allowed to go into that space. We cannot prohibit uh, someone right. outside that those rules. Okay. Um, we just try to work with them as best as we possibly can. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Long way to answer that. Sorry. Councilwoman Pia. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, will City Council get a copy of the final? Uh, the final report is actually on our website, okay. and I, uh, I wanted to put that in the uh, the memo link, but I was having a hard time with our linkages um, okay. that day when I set the memo. So it is available on our website, and I will send out a direct link to you so you can access it that way because it is it's a large report. And for the folks at home, the website is downtownferndale.com. Thanks. Okay. Well, I have to bring it up because I feel like it was written be because of me. Um, it was a direct statement in your memo uh, in presenting the analysis to council about the housing analysis um, because a year and a half ago or thereabouts, I tried to get the DDA and the city to look at doing a housing analysis of increased living in the downtown. Mm -hmm. And I know this market wasn't, market analysis didn't include a housing analysis, but a lot of the things that I saw in your presentation here was about increased living in the downtown, ad lib work to the website. So what are our types of our housing needs um, to provide a, a range of housing options, which I know we have a big solution to address some of that tonight, but um, that doesn't mean that we have a comprehensive review, not only for the, for the city or the downtown, about our housing needs. Right. And then um, I wanted to point out what's not in this study, at least from what I saw and I lament, but I have to bring it up, um, is that there are incentives in here to help deal with parking capacity and programs to help businesses offset the cost of parking, yet there's nothing in here about transit. So I would hope to, that we would have something in there basic to deal with our current transit system, but also planning for the future. So I just have to make that statement. <laughs> okay. Didn't sound like a question, so I don't think yeah. Nope, <laughs> nope. That's statement. Right. Any other comments, statements, or questions from council? Well, thank you. It was very, uh, very interesting. And I would note that there's a number of DDA board members and volunteers in the audience I see. So thanks, all of you, for coming out and sharing that with us. All right. Our next item of business is a public hearing on a proposed brownfield redevelopment project at 831 East Lewison and resolution approving combined brownfield 381 work plan. Derek, do you want to introduce that briefly? And then we'll uh, ask for public comment. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the project that's here before you is one uh, that deals with the city's uh, brownfield program and revolving loan fund. It's something council seen before in the past on similar type projects. It's a uh, medium-sized building uh, between seven and 8,000 square feet. It's uh, been declared functionally obsolete by the Oakland County Assessor. It does have some minor contamination in it uh, and surrounding the property. The applicant does want to redevelop the property and bring it into a more uh, current type use. Um, that use has not been finalized at this point. The applicant is asking for uh, about $107,000 in eligible activities to be reimbursed through the city's revolving loan fund. Then in turn, the TIF created at the site would go to reimburse the loan fund and then replenish it five years after that money is reimbursed. So it's a pretty standard plan. We are asking for both the capture of local and state education tax associated with the plan. Um, the payback period is approximately 14 to 15 years. Uh, then there would be an additional five years capture on the back end. Um, we still are working with the assessor on the final assessed values. Um, after the, if the project is approved, um, we would enter into a reimbursement agreement with the applicant, which would be in front of you within the next few weeks, I would imagine. Um, the applicant's environmental consultant from PM Environmental is here. He, however, is unable to be here. Um, and we asked to go ahead and present the project tonight anyways, due to some time constraints with the states and wanting to keep it moving. He did include a letter in your packet um, describing his project and uh, what he is looking to do with the site. Um, we can answer some questions about that. Obviously, we can't speak on his behalf, but uh, we do feel it's a pretty straightforward project and encouraged him to let us bring it forward to you tonight. 
So with that, we are here to answer any questions. Otherwise, there is a public hearing, and then there is a motion in your packet as well. Yeah, so first let's do the public hearing, and I want to open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address Council or Derek tonight on the proposed Brownfield Redevelopment Project at 831 East Lewiston? No. All right. So seeing none, I'll close the public hearing portion of it, and I'll ask Council if there are any questions or comments, concerns about this item. I mean, it's a, it, as you said, it's a standard, it's a standard kind of development uh, mechanism that we've used before. Um, it did appear before the Brownfield Authority. They did uh, approve it unanimously and recommended no. it before to you for approval. I have uh, one question, uh, Your Honor. Um, in the packet, it mentions uh, about the possibility of creating this site as a live-work um, environment. Um, given that it's in the center of the industrial zone, how does that affect zoning? Will that facility have to then be rezoned in order to allow someone to actually live in that space? It, it depends on how it's done, um, and it depends on what the primary use is uh, with the site. Uh, it, residential is not permitted as a primary use within that zoning district, but there are uses potentially that could have a residential component that's either incidental or ancillary to it. Um, we're actually looking at that right now. And, and he hasn't had, he doesn't have a final use. I know it's something he's considering. Mm -hmm. um, the Planning Commission, that is a, an area the Planning Commission has looked at for more flexible zoning. So we think, that, we think it fits within the intent of the Master Land Use Plan. So if we do have to move forward with either a rezoning or some other creative way of doing it, we are, we are willing to talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Uh, motion would be in order. I would move that City Council approve the attached resolution approving the combined Brownfield 381 work plan for 831 East Lewiston. Support. Uh, moved by Martin, supported by Lennon. Any last comments or questions? Sherilyn, could you call the roll, please? Council Members Martin? Yes. Polica? Yes. Tiana? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes. Thank you. That item is adopted. And Mr. George also asked me to pass along his thanks as well. Thanks. Thank thanks, you. Darren. <laughs> All right, our next item of business is call to audience. Call to audience is uh, 30 minutes now and more time if needed at the end of the meeting uh, for, you, for anyone in the audience to have up to three minutes to speak whatever is on their minds. Just give us your name uh, and your address. Uh, speak to things that aren't on the agenda, if you don't mind, because you'll get an opportunity to speak to the things that are on the agenda when we get to that portion of the agenda. So without further ado. Good evening, <laughs> Jeannie Davis. Um, I'm wearing two hats tonight. The first hat is as president of the Ferndale Seniors. Um, we're kind of proud to say, and actually a little ashamed and embarrassed to say, <laughs> that we're only just now organizing um, what we're calling a Sunshine Brigade, and it's uh, a group of people who have signed up to uh, help people who are in, in the middle of long-term illnesses, taking people to the doctor, running to the market for them, uh, this kind of thing. So we've actually, the, um, I initiated at the last meeting and 22 people signed up right on the spot wow. to help out. And That's I wonderful. want to thank Councilman Pollica for the idea because I was telling him how we had been helping one of our members, and he said, well, I'm surprised you, you girls don't have a committee for that. So <laughs> thank you very much, Councilman Pollock. My other hand. Can people volunteer still, or do you feel like you have enough? People or, can volunteer. Yeah. And, How would they do um, that? And uh, in order to be a recipient of this, you have to be a, a Ferndale senior, which isn't going to break the bank. It's $9 a year. So, <laughs> you know, you can do that. It's a bargain. So, uh, but yes, we would. We How would old do you have to be to be a Ferndale senior? You have to be 55, oh. I believe. You're I'm getting there. Yes. <laughs> <I am>. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you asked. <laughs> well, right into that one. Banner and the band when you join up here. <laughs> That's a great idea, though. Um, it is thanks. indeed, and and age is not um, a barrier to helping. We would be thrilled to have the younger people in the community sign up. There's a lot of things already. There's a lot of limitations on the on the people who've signed up. They can't stand for very long. I know um, helping this person, I experienced my first time pushing a wheelchair, and I discovered what it's like to push a wheelchair across three lanes of traffic. 
<laughs> on a salty road. It wasn't, you know. Mm -hmm. So we do, we could do with younger yeah. people. So yeah. yeah. Um, my other hat is um, I'm temporary head or unofficial head of the new Arts and Cultural Commission. I feel like I'm telling everybody we're getting the band back together. <laughs> we had our Literally. first official meeting this evening. We kicked uh -huh. around a lot of ideas, and I just want to keep council informed on what we're doing. We have fundraisers um, already in the works. We're planning on having a coming out party in May at um, Dean Box. Uh, maybe we'll call it a shower. People bring things. A lot of people are asking me, will we bring back music in the park? Absolutely. We're planning on two performances at Music in the Park. We're, um, that's what we were talking about tonight, was ways to raise the funds for it. And we've, we've agreed that until we get our own persona worked out, because we're not like the old Art Commission, we're, we're looking for other groups to collaborate with. We're already um, in the works with the Friends of the Library. We're planning a murder mystery dinner at the library where everybody comes in costume, et cetera. It'll be a, a fun fundraiser, and we'll split the funds. So um, we're, we're thinking maybe some of the youth associations, we can collaborate with them on, on fundraising. So um, if there's anybody out there that um, is in a group like um, the youth assistants, we'd be happy to work with them on something. So, And on the commission at this point is Mark Burton, Joanne Wilcock, and Francine Hatcham, and Sherry Kruzman Martin and myself. Great. Really? Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I applaud that. <laughs> Good evening, Mary. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mary Schuster Bauer, and this evening I'm here representing um, Citizens for a Fair Ferndale. And our mission is to foster a community that is dedicated to the fair and equal treatment of all residents and visitors. Um, most of you know us already because of the wonderful candidate forums that we provide every year for every election, and I think every one of you have participated. Um, and uh, you may also know us for our wildly popular Good Neighbor Project. Uh, this year, if you were at the DIY Festival, you saw our booth set up where we were asking people, how will you be a good neighbor? having them write it out and snap pictures, and it was a wonderful project. We also created a good neighbor resolution, which you passed unanimously, and we created pledges for citizens to talk about how they will be civil when they interact with each other. And um, I see that we have in the audience our esteemed county commissioner, Helene Zack, <laughs> who uh, very recently uh, authored a proclamation uh, celebrating Citizens for Fair Ferndale for the Civility Project, and we were honored to go to the Board of Commission meeting and receive that. But tonight, I'm here to talk about our signature project that I think, well, I think it's one of our signature projects that we've put on for the last several years, and it's called the Good Neighbors Equal Strong Community Awards. And that is where we recognize people in our community who are actually living out the mission of Citizens for Fair Ferndale, whether they've ever heard of us or not. They are doing things to make our community stronger and safer and more accepting for people around them. So our nominations are due this coming Friday. So that's why I'm here tonight, to make sure that you know those of you up there, those of you in the audience or watching at home, we would like more nominations. We, every year we recognize about 10 people or organizations, uh, and the pool is usually strong, so make your, make your nominations as specific as you possibly can. And you might be saying, oh, but I'm not sure if I have a stamp. I don't know if I can get to the post office. But wait, you just need to go to fairferndale.org. Yes, that's right, fairferndale.org. <laughs> go to the website. You can look at the nomination, you can fill it out online, or you can print it and find a stamp and mail it to us. And right on the website, there are examples of past winners, and we have a whole list of frequently asked questions. And we certainly do want your nominations, and City Council, you will be getting your invitation to attend, as will nominees, past nominees, and all of those folks. If you have questions, I'd be glad to answer. Any questions for Mary? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. And Helena, you, you probably, did we put a switcheroo on you with the time? Is that, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we missed you at the presentations, but I had a feeling uh, we probably didn't uh, tell you. We're starting at 7 o'clock now. 
Okay. Sorry, I missed <laughs> that, but I got here. A um, couple of things that I just want to remind people that every year we approve tax deferments for those people who have to wait for their homestead check to come through. And so you can register with the city. Technically, you were supposed to register with the city by February 15th, but I'm sure we could make some exception. And that means that you can defer your tax payment after the 15th until you get your refund on homestead, particularly for low income and seniors. A um, couple of big macro issues that are going to come across my commissioner desk this year. Water, okay, obviously this is a very hot topic. We are watching it. I'm watching it closely as your county commissioner. There are a multitude of different negotiations going on between our water resource commissioner, um, Jim Nash, and Brooks um, Patterson's deputies you know, tr looking at whether it's feasible to do a, an authority or not. I have lots of position papers. I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, we want to protect our interests. We don't want to have ridiculously high bills. We want to have say in water issues. I really don't have much to offer right now, but we're watching it closely, and I will keep you posted. This is the year for the smart millage to go on the, you know, to come up before us. And every time I have to vote on this, I hate the opt, the opt out thing. I certainly will try and keep it so that we could have a universal county vote. I don't know, you know, if that's possible, but I want to let you know that's coming up. And then the other big ticket item is watching the Detroit Institute of Arts and what happens with that with the bankruptcy. Um, as you all may recall, we voted on a millage a couple years ago, which um, I heard from more people on that topic than anything in my career as county commissioner in 11 years. I totally support that millage. But if the conditions of the contract change between the county and the city, then we might have to reopen that contract which I hope we don't have to do. But it's something that we're watching closely, and I will keep you posted on that. That's it tonight. Any questions for me? Nope. Oh, appreciate you being Thank here. You. All right. Good to see you. Anyone else? Hi. Hi. I public speak. Um, tonight at Maria's, uh, the Casa Japanese class is hosting a fundraiser to help us raise funds to go to Japan on a peace mission. One of our first stops is Hiroshima, and we have a thousand cranes currently being made, you know, ready to go. We just need the funds to get there. So if you guys could come and support us after a very, very exciting um, city council meeting, that would be super fun. We've got face painting and uh, calligraphy. Can you say who you are? I'm Rebecca Phoenix. <laughs> um, my mom is the Jackie Smith who owns the Candle Lake shop. Uh, I don't think, I don't know anybody who hasn't met her, which is, <laughs> which is you know, my life. Um, my dad in the audience. <laughs> Trying to be slick. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, let's clap for that. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening. Paul Kish, 707 West Hazelhurst. On February 19th, 2014, 287 days after I submitted my first complaint to April Lynch about the water bill, she agreed that this water bill, with its service period and read dates not being aligned, is misleading and confusing. Mm -hmm. Dan Martin was at that meeting. Uh, I also request, requested from April Lynch at the meeting the names of the two people who presided over the Board of Review hearing in 2012. She agreed to forward that information to me. To date, April Lynch has not responded with that information. I submitted a document to the state of Michigan on December 31st asking for a hearing, and that board of review is part of that hearing. I was given 60 days to submit additional information.
That's why I needed that. So the information that I will submit is that she failed to give me the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council this evening? Hi. <laughs> good evening, council, mayor. Good to see you guys. Uh, my name is Robert Wittenberg, and I'm a candidate for the 27th House District, which includes Ferndale. Uh, and just wanted to invite you and everyone in the audience, and everyone at home, uh, we're going to have a candidate forum. It's this Thursday, the Oak Park Huntington Woods Democrats Club is hosting it, and it's going to be at uh, the Oak Park Community Center at 7 p.m. Uh, there are five of us. There's five candidates. So for those of you that you know, want to kind of get to know who's going to be uh, you know, on, on the ballot in August, again, this is for the primary that's coming up in August. So this will be an event where each candidate will get to introduce themselves, talk for a few minutes, and then there'll be some questions from the audience. So just wanted to make sure everyone here knows about it and everyone knows that they are welcome. Date and time again? It'll be on Thursday, so this coming Thursday, 7 p.m. And let me just double check. I know it's so it's at the Oak Park Community Center, which is at 14300 Oak Park Boulevard. Excellent. So I just want to let you know. Very good. Thank right. you. Thanks. Anyone else would like to address council this evening? All right. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are items that we consider routine and we enact in one motion unless council pulls something from the consent agenda. Uh, let me read that agenda now. Item A is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held February 24th, 2014 and the special meeting held March 3rd, 2014. Item B is the approval of the reimbursement agreement for 965 Wanda Combined Brownfield Plan. Item C is the adoption of the amended local government appro approval resolution to clarify approval of request from Gigabyte Inc. doing business as the fly trap for an on-premises redevelopment liquor license to be located at 22950 Woodward Avenue. Item D is the approval of a special event permit for National Main Street Conference Welcoming Reception on Saturday, May 17th, 2014. Item E is the approval of a special event permit for Girls on the Run 5K to be held on Sunday, May the 18th, 2014. Item F is the approval to purchase Cisco Network Equipment. Item G is the approval of the bills and payroll as submitted by the City Manager's Office subject to the review of the Council Finance Committee. What is the pleasure of council this evening on the consent agenda? I move to adopt the consent agenda as presented. I support. Uh, moved by Lennon and supported by Piana. Is there any discussion, either from members of the audience or from council, on the consent agenda this evening? Sherilyn, would you call the roll, please? Council members Pollica? Yes. Piana? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Martin is momentarily absent, and Mayor Coulter. Uh, yes, thank you. The consent agenda is adopted. Moving on now to the regular agenda. Uh, regular agenda item A is the consideration to appoint Everett, Everett uh, Kaiser to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. And uh, Councilman Pollicka, do you want to introduce that item as our liaison to that committee? I sure can. Um, well, uh, Mr. Uh, Kaiser has submitted an application to be on the uh, Parks and Rec Board, and uh, I request that you support his appointment. Uh, he is uh, very energetic about being on the uh, on the commission. Right now, he's very involved in the uh, the Dales. Do you call it the Dales Block Club? The, the Dales. Uh, the Dales group. The Dales Over group. Energy. Okay, uh, very active in that. So uh, I think it's it's a nice marriage of someone in a community that um, has a passion for the neighborhood he's in, and also going to bring some of that energy onto the Parks Commission. And uh, I don't know, Everett's here. If he wants to get up and say a, a word or two, or just wave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening. <laughs> good evening. So, um, I've lived in Ferndale for about 11 years or so, and I have not seen the parks really improved in that time. Mm -hmm. And in the last 
five years, I have a very good reason to, to see them improve. So <laughs> I'd like to, to see those playgrounds get better, see the parks uh, a little bit more vibrant before he's uh, before my son's too old to, to play on them. Thank you. Great. As would we. And I appreciate, you know, last year we did the, the Blue Ribbon uh, Committee on Parks, and you gave great input into that, and we hope to implement some of those things this year. So I hope to see better things for our parks, but appreciate your willingness to, to serve on that committee. Well, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Everett and I co-founded the Dales Neighborhood Group, so in the last year and a half um, we've worked very closely together, so I certainly know his work ethic. And to me this is just a natural progression that he ends up on the Parks and Recreation uh, Department since he's been um, the, the main voice of our neighborhood on parks. Um, so I really appreciate you going a step further and uh, doing more community service <laughs> above and beyond the Dales Group. And for people who don't know, his wife is also uh, actively involved in our city as our city librarian, <laughs> in, case, in case that last name sounded familiar to you. Uh, any other discussion on this item? Um, a motion would be uh, in order. I would like to make the motion to uh, confirm the appointment of Everett Kaiser to the Ferndale Parks and Recreation Advisory Board for a term ending December 31st, 2016. Support. And support, uh, moved by Pollocka, supported by Martin. Yeah. Um, all right, any further discussion or comments? Sherilyn? Council Members Piana? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Martin? Yes. Pollocka? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. The appointment is adopted. Thank you again. Um, regular agenda item B is a consideration to set a public hearing date of March 24, 2014 for the DNR grant applications. Um, do you want to take that? Or I know Jill is here, or she was. Yep, Jill, do you want to introduce that item for us? Thanks. Good evening. Our mic is like yes. has issues tonight. It's got a mind of its own today. Yes, it does. <laughs> we are currently working on two um, Department of Natural Resources Trust Fund grant applications for park improvements at both. Um, Martin Road Park and Harding Park. Each application um, proposes a permanent walking path and a new plate structure, um, both of which will be in compliance with ADA requirements um, and are sure to increase park usage and accessibility throughout our parks. Um, both of those items are key, com key factors in our current Parks and Rec Master Plan, um, are listed as priorities. Um, both in the plan and um, the proposed projects are also um, part of our capital improvement plan as well. Um, the deadline to apply for these grants is April 1, um, and as part of the application process, um, is required that we set a public hearing to take comments on the on the application. So that is the request that you see before you. Very good. Thanks. Any questions on this item? Good luck. Yeah, we'll cross our fingers on that yep. one, Bring that one home. All it. right, is there a motion? I make a motion to set a public hearing date of March 24th, 2014 at 7 p.m. to take comments regarding the submittal of a Department of Natural Resources Trust Grant, I'm sorry, Trust Fund Grant for improvements at Harding Park and Martin Road Park. I support. I move by Pollocka, supported by Piana. Any other discussion? Questions? Sherlyn, call the roll. Council members Lennon? Yes. Martin? Yes. Holica? Yes. Tiana? Yes. And Mayor Colton? <clears throat> yes, thank you. That item is adopted. Uh, moving on to our final regular agenda item C is a consideration to approve an exclusive negotiating rights agreement for the redevelopment of city owned property. And uh, Derek, you can introduce that item this evening. Yes, gladly. Um, good evening again. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, introduce a topic that's been discussed at some length in the downtown in the city uh, over the last few years. Uh, the city has, is currently in receipt of two uh, what we're call, calling exclusive negotiating rights agreements, which uh, basically either agreement uh, opens up a window for exclusive negotiation regarding um, a piece of city property. Um, the first agreement uh, we'll refer to as the city center project is one that's been discussed uh, for some time in the city. It deals with the eastern portion of the Withington lot. Um, it is a, uh, in concept, a parking deck and residential pro, uh, project. 
Um, the second project is one that's a little more extensive. It's one that uh, staff has been involved in and actually has is, is, uh, been uh, part of the discussions with for, for some time now. It is a, 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 we'll refer to that as the 360 project as we go forward. Um, both groups have submitted the, the exclusive negotiating rights agreements. The 360 project deals with both the entirety of the Withington lot and the Troy lot as well. Um, and includes components of office, apartment, or, or residential, and parking decks. Um, both projects are, are only here tonight um, to discuss the exclusivity. We're not here at this point to actually uh, negotiate the specific above-ground developments. We're asking <coughs> to take a look at both agreements and uh, consider one to move forward with for a specific window of time. Uh, the City Center project is requesting six months currently. Um, to negotiate uh, for a development or a development agreement on that site. Uh, the 360 projects is looking at a longer time. It is a much larger project potentially. Uh, they are requesting 18 months at this time. Um, there is a recommendation from staff regarding the projects. Staff at this time is recommending to move forward with the 360 group. Um, that is in large part due to one component of the project or the potential for one component, um, and that is that group is interested in looking to bring uh, high tech and second stage office to the to the city um, and we think that's compel a compelling enough reason to at least investigate it at this time uh, we're not making again we're not here making a recommendation that we're saying one project is going to work and one project isn't we believe both projects offer great opportunity for the downtown at this time uh, we think both projects are viable we think both projects fit within the city council's goals and objectives within the city's master land use plan uh, within, within the DDA's goals and objectives and strategies. Um, we think both projects are an opportunity to move forward uh, in a public-private type partnership um, to see the next evolution of, of our downtown and hopefully provide some of that mixed use and parking that we've been talking about for so long. So I think at this point, I know uh, I think both groups are going to speak for a couple of minutes. Yeah. I'm going to step back and Mayor, let you introduce who you'd like to speak with first, and then obviously we'll be here to answer any <coughs> unless there's some questions right now up front. Not yet. I know there are representatives of both um, development groups, so um, I guess we'll just take them in the order that we got them in our pack. So the Bez Tech folks, why don't you come on up and introduce yourselves and. Uh, Explain a little bit about your project. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, my name is Sam Beznos. I'm with the Beztech Companies. Um, thank you for having us. I'm excited to be here, and I appreciate your consideration on our project. Um, I'm also here with Bob Wolfson, um, who I've been working with very closely on this project, who you guys may know, who has been uh, actively pursuing the development of the Withington lot for many years. Um, as Derek indicated, we, um, we proposed a uh, letter of intent um, to uh, exclusively negotiate with uh, the city um, for six months on a proposed development on the lot. And in concept, without getting too much detail, we were proposing 100 residential units basically on the eastern side of the lot, lot sort of split, um, as well as a parking garage that would satisfy the city's need, uh, which we believe uh, there's a need for additional parking and um, accommodate future needs as well and also support uh, accommodate the parking for the residential development. And um, we believe that is the best use for the project and most feasible, um, and, um, and that's why we're here today. Um, we've been working with Newman Smith, who did a, a number of uh, iterations, um, but you know, this is not exactly the format of it. But basically, the, uh, the development was proposing potentially uh, um, a couple of stories of parking garage as well as residential on top, somewhere between three, four stories. Yeah. Uh, it would vary based on the needs of the parking. Um, BezTac, um, I'm the CEO and one of the partners. Um, I'm one of the CEO and partners of BezTac, and we've been a uh, nationwide real estate developer. We've developed more than 15,000 apartment units. We build them, design them from the ground up. Um, we do uh, apartments, senior housing, commercial, office, um, lot developments, and we do it all, and I've provided a package that I think you guys all saw some of our recent developments and stuff we've done historically around this town yeah. as well as uh, around the country. 
Um, so we, we looked at this site. I, I spent a lot of time personally in Ferndale and um, I love here. I love it. You know, I come to dinner, go out, and I think it's a, the right development for this town. There needs to be more housing, and we think this is really the, the most appropriate use. We consider other uses as well. But uh, given the cost of the construction and, you know, rents in the area for office and retail and the visibility, we thought this was the most feasible. So, um, you know, I'm here to answer any questions you might have, but I also think I interviewed okay. Bob Wolfson, who I'm working yeah. with closely on this development. He probably has a few things to say. Thanks. Just hey, Bob. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I think everybody pretty much knows me. Um, the only thing I can say is we've been involved in Ferndale for pretty close to six years now and uh, enjoyed get being the first guys to do something in the market. Um, in addition, we've lived it and breathed it. My children lived here. I lived here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the Festec Corporation definitely has the experience to do the right thing for this city, and um, we're looking forward to the opportunity of doing so. Um, all I can tell you is, is I think that the city is going to grow, it's going to do well, and uh, we'd like to be a part of it again. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Any questions? Uh, not yet. We'll get to that portion. Um, and now I know there are also representatives of the other development group, the 360 Ferndale group. And so there they are in the back. If you guys want to come on up and briefly describe for us your concept. Again, and just so people know, we're not getting into details here. We haven't figured out square footage and doors and windows and that sort of thing. But in general, uh, what is your vision for your project? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council, uh, as well as the staff and residents of Ferndale. Uh, my name is Jake Siegel. I live in Ferndale with my wife. We're at the corner of Academy and Hilton. Lived here for about seven years now. And I started my business in Ferndale. I started a company out of my guest bedroom in 2008. And uh, long story short, we just sold the company to Ford in October of this year as a software company putting apps into cars. I have a lot of experience with the tech community with uh, being an entrepreneur, with the needs of these tech companies in automotive and beyond, financial tech, all sorts of the startups and second stage companies that are around the area. And what I've found in, in my business is it's very hard to hire um, uh, software engineers and, and other young tech talent to get them to stay in Michigan. So people that are graduating from University of Michigan, Michigan State, Kettering, and a whole lot of other great universities, they're, they're flocking away. And what I saw in Ferndale, and most of this has been seen from my bike and you know, as my wife and I ride around, is that there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to create a really cool tech scene, very much like what we have in downtown Detroit with Detroit Venture Partners, which uh, Dan Gilbert was also one of our investors in Livio uh, prior to the acquisition, what we see in Midtown, and what we've seen, uh, quite frankly, in most other cities our size, is, is growth opportunities within the tech community. So I, I like most of our residents, want to see better parking and, and want to see uh, um, an easy way to, to, to get downtown. I also think that you know, having residential is, is key, but I think the real opportunity here is creating jobs, and you create more density and create collisions downtown. So I'd like to see uh, an opportunity to bring in more tech talent into this downtown area and really create a, a nice place for our tech community to, to have, and that's what uh, um, started this whole project. So I'll turn it over to Dennis to talk a little bit about our project and our de development team. Hey. Thank you very much. I'm Dennis Griffin with CBRE, based out of Southfield. And uh, thank you very much for um, allowing me to be here and, and explain kind of what I've come up with after being invited to look at this opportunity. Um, one of my colleagues, Matt Osaki, um, had met um, Jake Siegel and um, Derek Delacourt and said there's an opportunity um, to fill some voids in the city of Ferndale. So I came and looked at it from a very classic sense. Um, I met with Jake, listened to his vision, his experience. Um, it's not every day that you can um, get right with the CEO, someone coming into the second and third stage funding, and get their direct experience. We have those as tenant clients at CBRE, but not, uh, not the time to get what's cutting edge. So from that, I looked at the vision, listened to it, 
and understood it. And then I went and looked at the real estate, and I asked them, Derek, to submit you know all of the public pieces of property in the area. And there's several. There's several opportunities, um, immediate and in the future. Um, so, what I kind of framed it as a 360 view of the entire area, and that's where the name has come from. And our original focus was on the east side because we could see real immediate adjacencies. And then, looking further, I focused on the Troy Street lot and the Withington lot. Those are the current infrastructure pieces that are kind of servicing your downtown. Yeah, I know they get congested on weekends. So we kind of approached it as an infrastructure first type of analysis. I said, okay, we'll start with the infrastructure and we need more. So we said, those are the areas that can support, you know, affordable larger decks. I said, okay, with that, how can we use that infrastructure to add on the city needs? And all suburban urban areas are thirsting for office. Daytime population, new families, growth, badges of honor when you have companies like Jake's. So we interjected an office component second. And there's some very interesting opportunities in how to make new office product affordable. And that's sharing infrastructure. You can share foundations. You can share elevators. You can share streetscapes. You can share utility hookups. So that's kind of an approach on how to have an economic alternative to a Southfield, um, which there's plenty of vacant spaces. Some of them are called free. So nothing's going to be free on a new development, but there's quality of life, there's quality of hiring, there's quality of um, entrepreneurship that'll make people approach a 360-type development. And we agree housing is a component. That's the classic mixed use housing. Very little bit of retail in our concept because you have plenty of retail and plenty of buildings that can have a higher use as we heard from the DDA. The infrastructure first component can help lift everything for all stakeholders. So that's kind of, I don't make sure I didn't miss any notes there. Yeah, so that's going back to the client contact division that was Jake. I did a classic review of the market dynamics in the, re in the real estate and came up with a concept and had Krieger Klatt architects you know, validate my program. Again, these buildings work you know, with the parking component and it appears that it's earnest of, uh, worthy of more earnest investigation. And then the next step for me was who's the development team that can pull this together? And that's when we tapped um, Greg Ernie from Versa and Greg Cooksey from CG Emerson, who have experience in urban and suburban development and are very compatible and have experience in public-private partnerships. So that's where we are today, and we look forward to the opportunity to roll up our sleeves and work with you. Thank you. Thanks. Don't go too far because there'll probably be some questions I'm <clears throat> guessing. So if you could. Just as a, as a quick point, um, we know this has been difficult for both groups um, uh, once they became aware of each other. Um, from a staff standpoint, it's been, it's been a kind of a joy working with both of them. They both have great ideas for the downtown. Um, as far as, uh, where, again, why we're here tonight is we, we'd really like the opportunity to move forward in discussions. Um, we're at the infancy stage, uh, very initial first step stage. Um, in the staff report to uh, City Council, what we've suggested is that if this exclusivity window is open with either group, that the next steps would be to immediately engage the City's Planning Commission, um, potentially with a planned unit development option, um, which allows the City to uh, negotiate development agreements that uh, would run with the land um, for the projects. That is a, a very public and open and transparent process um, as it deals with review of the site. Um, there are public hearings involved. And we believe that most likely that is the best way to move forward. And then possibly concurrently, we've spoken to the city attorney that uh, it, when, as it comes to dealing with potential sale of the property, um, that there be a concurrent development agreement or a component of the PUD that is negotiated with city council that deals with the actual sale of the property and potential acquisition of, of large scale public infrastructure components. So those would be the, the, the two concurrent processes we would recommend moving forward with, regardless of which, which project uh, you guys uh, decide to go forward with at this point. So um, obviously we would be naive if we thought this was a, a 
very simple process. Either one of these projects will, will have their obstacles. Um, we look forward to discussing either one of them, um, but we think this is a good first step and, and a good opportunity for the city to move forward. So. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just guess that there may be some folks here tonight that want to address council on this issue. So before council debates and ask questions, I will give the uh, I will give. Uh, Uh, I give the audience an opportunity to ask questions first. So, yes, give us your name in three minutes. Sherry Wells, 315 West Troy, and there are other West Troy people as well. We do talk to each other quite a lot. And when the uh, – I believe that both sides of Nine Mile Road do need to have some parking structures. What I've noticed is there's a lot of vacant parking. Uh, north of Nine Mile Road, and most of the bars and such are on the south side of Nine Mile Road. And that's really where we have a great deal of overflow parking. Uh, when we were going through this before on the, the West Troy Street parking lot, a possible building, uh, we neighbors really liked the fact that they listened to us when we were talking about egress, where people coming out of the parking area don't dump them into our neighborhood. And so they revised their plans. Uh, so we don't really have a problem with something being built there and something being built uh, on the other side. But at that point is when you have the opportunity to the residential-only parking. And right now, uh, Withington, more than anything, because there's all those parking spaces that are empty, not having the money contribute to, it, to this parking fund while all the residential side is filled up. And then our residential sides on West Troy and Saratoga are just – full of other people's cars who are avoiding parking. So at that point, the only way they're going to use these parking structures is if they're made to do that by giving us a residential only. And that's it for now. All right. Thank you. Anyone else like to address council on these, on this issue? Good evening. Hello. Uh, I'm in between bifocals and regular glasses. So. <laughs> uh, I think most of you know me, Mindy Couples, 354 East Marshall. Uh, I, was, I was undecided on whether I was going to say anything tonight. I'm glad that I came to this meeting. Um, I think mostly everybody knows me and knows that I have an interest as a resident in downtown Ferndale. Um, all, I would, all I would say is that I would, I would like council to consider not just Obviously, we need a parking structure that is, that's obvious. Uh, the residents want one. I would encourage council to uh, think about and work with uh, both of these uh, developments to consider where, really where those um, structures should be and where they would look the best. Um, personally, I think this lot right next door would be ideal for a loft, retail, parking, area or even business. Um, I think it would have the lowest impact on residents, uh, although if, if anything, a parking structure would help the people right behind this building. As you know, I mean, there's a lot of issues during the, on the weekends with parking on their streets also. Um, I think it would be, it would help in having a structure like that would help in beautifying the city and expanding it widthwise as well as the downtown district at least. And um, and I guess that's all I wanted to mention today. I really had like three pages written, but <laughs> getting kind of late, and I get up really early, so I just wanted to, you know, at least say what I had to say about the uh, idea. And I look forward to other public meetings and any other uh, involvement that you guys may have with the residents Thanks. and businesses and the developments. And if people don't know, you're also a board member of the DDA and will certainly be engaging the DDA board and, and business owners in this process. So Thanks, you will hear a lot more. Anyone else who would like to address council this evening? Good evening. Hey, good, evening. good to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, my name is John. I'm a Ferndale resident, and I'm also an owner, the owner of uh, Modern Natural Baby. Um, I have two shocking Two shocking secrets today, right? <laughs> Dramatic pause. The first thing is, um, the first thing with what we have is, with par uh, hold on, let me let me get my train of thought here. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is with parking. 
with being, being, uh, being a retailer, with parking, here's the secret. We don't have a parking problem. And why is that? Because we don't have a lot of residential in our area, right? So our, our hours are between 10 and 6. So when you tell us that there's a possibility that you're going to put a structure right in front of us, that's a little shocking to us. And I think it's one of those things is when you're a retail space, and I think that's what we're, always, we're trying to do as a mixed bag, to have retail and bars and restaurants. But what happens when you put a parking structure there is you put obstacles in the way for people making a purchase. For retail, you want to make that, that purchase as quick as possible without obstacles. You put a parking deck, and all of a sudden what you do is people who want to bring, bring retail in your, in your area won't do it because they see a parking structure. Would we have moved into Ferndale if there was a parking structure there? The answer is no. The second secret is, is our, we do modern natural baby, right? Not natural baby stores don't do well in a lot of places in the United States. But not only do we do well, but we're thriving, right? So what I'm saying to you is retail works in Ferndale. And I think if we can get that message that retail actually does work, what we can do is we can have, um, we can have that, inner, that, that evening business and that daytime business. We are thriving. We're one of the largest natural baby stores in the United States. And why? It's because of Ferndale. It wouldn't work in any other community except maybe Ann Arbor and Ferndale. So I think what we have to do is we have to push that retail and say, all right, what we need is we need 10 to 6 type of business, opposed to saying, if you put up a parking structure, what happens is you get more bar business. Why? Because now more people can come to the area and the owners look at that and say, we have plenty of parking spaces. Of course we can do two or three more bars. If we want to go in that direction to become Royal Oak, then that's what we do. But what I see is a retail during the day where our streets are thriving. And if we can do that and then have business, uh, bar business and restaurant business thriving as well, we don't lose the essence of what Ferndale is. And I think that's always going to be the thing is we have to make sure not to lose what makes us special uh, besides great cities like Royal Oak. But I, I want to make sure that we don't just jump into things and put an eyesore right in front of a building where uh, – my, uh, my customer doesn't want to bring their kids because they have to go down a ramp or go into a section and instead just doesn't want to visit it. In the current condition, it's a thriving retail business. I think we have to keep that in mind. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Anyone else like to address council this evening on this item? Good evening. Uh, my name is Emily Murray. I live at 210 East Camborne, and I own Modern Natural Baby as well at 200 West Nine Mile. Um, so, uh, obviously, my husband just spoke, um, but I have a little, uh, just a different perspective on, I'm just concerned, with the Withington lot, I don't think it can handle a parking structure. Um, it's too close to the buildings, whereas, like, the Troy lot is across the street. And it, I think a structure would work a lot better there. Um, I'm concerned that my customers who park in the back will never even see my business. They won't know where I'm at because there's gonna be a gigantic structure in front of it. Um, and I just, I just don't see how that. And the Withington lot, I don't, I, especially during retail hours, it doesn't need more parking spaces. I can never find a space in the Troy lot. I've never had a problem finding a space in the Withington lot. Um, so that's just my concern is that it's it's just too close to the building to be you know functional and like like John said my customers have babies and children they're pregnant um, at one point when we talked about parking you know before I mentioned even having you know like pregnant mother parking spaces and this is like the opposite of that because now my pregnant women can't park as close to my store as they can they have to park on the top floor of a deck or something and it's just a lot of walking to do with small children and that. And I mean, obviously that's, you know, specific to my business, but um, I'm one of the largest businesses in, on Nine Mile. So um, I just wanted to express my concern with the structure in the Withington lot. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else would like to address council on this issue? Good evening. Hello, Chris Best, Rust Belt Market resident uh, in Ferndale. Uh, I don't really have a question. I think uh, it's exciting. Um, 
also I'm the owner of the Rust Belt Market. I think, did I just say that? You did. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyway. that's a nice store, say it twice. I, just was, I was just curious, before everybody uh, gets worked up about the, the, the coming uh, structure or uh, the business, uh, I love the, uh, the idea of tech component and the future that it uh, could bring to Ferndale. I think it's exciting stuff. The question is, is when? Um, just maybe I could have reserved this question until after the meeting, but just out of curiosity, if somebody wants to, which uh, I'm sure there's individual. Well, hang tight and we'll talk about that. Okay. We need to debate the, the length of the agreement That's and the length of the. Say. Yeah, it's great. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Have it. My question about the agreement is uh, probably more for, for Derek. Uh, by entering into the agreement, does the city automatically need to take what development comes out of it? Or, you know, is there a, a, an out for the city? And we're going to talk about what we're committing to, what would we would be committing to, uh, what our, ram, our options are. And so good question, but hang tight. We, that will be addressed. Anyone else? All right. Um, so now is council's opportunity to ask questions and um, ex comments. And I'm guessing, I, I was just guessing that they would address some of these. If not, I will ask your questions for you. But I'm guessing that those things will come up. So who would like to begin? I will. Councilwoman Piano. So I wanted to start, of, I wanted to start out macro about where, where we are and where I think we're going. And um, it's been mentioned by, by Derek uh, about these two proposals and where we are in our downtown. And I say, this is downtown 3.0. And we've been preparing for this type of moment for a very long time, um, especially in response to the, the downturn in the real estate market, where we have been actively trying to find and attract development into our community to address um, the shared interests that we've heard for over the last 10 years about um, our goals and objectives of the downtown. So in my opinion, you know, redeveloping these, these, these properties, these sites, is part of setting a redevelopment site vision for, for um, our downtown. And since we've been working on improving our economic development strategies so that when these proposals came to council, we would be ready to go, meaning that it would be an easy process working with the developer. And so for me, preparing for this moment is achieving some of our, our visions for the downtown, which is incru uh, increasing, increasing the number of housing types and options for people to live in our downtown, increasing the number of families in our downtown, um, attracting more retail in our downtown, which is something that the DDA has been actively trying to do, um, particularly during the downturn. And we've been successful because of a lot of entrepreneurs. And we're really trying to improve the pedestrian experience because it's much better to walk it next to uh, a, a building than an empty lot um, with, with cars in it. And so to me, it's about um, improving the pest pedestrian experience and fulfilling the goals and vision of where we were trying to go in the last 10 years. And so for me, um, I'm really excited by these two proposals. I'm very happy that you're here, finally. Um, <laughs> we have a long way to go. This is just step one of a very long journey with our residents. But I wanted to make sure that um, what I heard tonight and is that um, we're not to lose what Ferndale what makes Ferndale special. And I hear this a lot from a lot of our business owners. And so can we do infill development? And can we build um, higher buildings following our zoning ordinance without losing who we are, without losing Ferndale's creativity and DNA? And I say yes, but it's going to be a good partner with the developer that we do that with. Um, so I think this is the journey where we um, start with with whoever we choose tonight, um, that we set these expectations. And so one thing that I'm looking for, which isn't in the agreement, but I want to set the expectation now, and I'm sure you all have heard me say it, um, is that we really need to have a strong public participation plan going forward, um, not just doing the basics of doing outreach. If the public is expected to only come to the site plan review hearing to hear what's going on with the project, then I think we failed in terms of doing good outreach to our businesses and residents um, as we go through figuring out what this change in our downtown is going to look like. And we work with the, uh, the design um, and with the developers. And so that's what I'm looking for. Um, and, you know, 
we're going to have to explain what the PUD process is, the planned unit development process, because we haven't used that tool in a really long time, because we haven't had the opportunity to do it. So that's sort of where I am in terms of setting the macro level of where we are with these um, exclusive, with these agreements and where it could lead to, and how, how do we interact with our, our citizens about how this is going to look like. So that's sort of where I am now. So on that point, let me ask Dara, could you just briefly walk us through a little bit of the timeline and the, and the touch points where residents and businesses have an opportunity for input? And that's sort of the minimum, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you that there's opportunity for additional. But sort of walk us through how people will be able to input into this process. Absolutely. I mean, I think it goes without saying that a project, either one of these projects, is, is, is a rather large-scale project. And, one of the things we're going to do in short order is come in up with a, a, a public participation plan that goes along with the project if we do go forward. Um, that's part of the reason it's so important and, and we're recommending so strongly that at least one of the agreements we move forward with so we know what we're dealing with, what the project may look like, what the scope and size of it is, um, so we can start to put that together. Uh, the formal process through the PUD process, I would assume, would, would involve at least the formal approval process, multiple meetings with the Planning Commission, um, their goal or, or their responsibility in this would be to, to dis discuss the above ground development itself. Um, the design of the building handles many of the issues that were brought up tonight by uh, the folks from Modern Natural Baby and some of the other retailers that are concerned and give them an opportunity to make sure that if there is a design and if there is a structure and if there is, whether it's just residential or whether it's an office component as well, that that has as little negative impact, if any at all, on their existing operations and hopefully can be done in a way that in, in the long term enhances their operation. Um, we certainly understand the concerns that have been presented here tonight. They're valid. They're real. Um, anytime you do a development like this, it can have an impact on your existing retailers and other users. Um, but the, those discussions would take place with the Planning Commission. We also think, I'm sure the Planning Commission as well as Councilman and Councilwoman Pian is on, that, on the Commission, is going to want to see, see us do some additional public outreach. And we'd like to meet with them as soon as possible to see what they feel is appropriate and have that discussion with them as well, whether it's only at the Planning Commission meeting, whether it's some workshops, whether it's some joint meetings with uh, City Council and the Brownfield Authority if there's, if there's Brownfield components. Whatever those are, we'd like to put those together in short order. But I, I think you can, a, a, at a minimum, depend on that, and I would expect a considerable amount more going Thanks. forward. Thanks. And then if I may, I have more questions, but I'll, I'll, let, other, I'll let other people talk um, after I say this bit. Um, I'm really excited about the expanded project. Um, I think we need to um, go down that path to say, hey, um, will this expanded project with office space work in our downtown, and if it doesn't, um, take a step back and say, okay, um, we have another opportunity with another developer. How does this fit into to the mix of um, um, options and choices that we can we can make for um, doing development. So. Um, and I'm also a little concerned about the 18 month timeline um, for the second um, project because there's a six month um, wait period for um, um, BESTEC and then there's an 18 month and I'm just concerned that would be tying up opportunity um, for 18 months. It's almost two years, and I'm not sure our, our, our businesses uh, want to wait two years to even start a project. I mean, like, Understood. shovels in the ground. If I could piggyback <laughs> back off of what Councilwoman Piana said, I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with 18 months as well because it seems like a, a, a long amount of time that we're going to um, be engaged in this study and, and to tie things up, and it, it plays havoc with all kinds of things, right? Not only uh, the businesses downtown waiting to see what happens, but with the real estate market about what it'll look like in the area down the road, and and uh, a lot of s may fuel, I think, some speculation around that. So I would like to see us address that 18-month time frame on the on the one proposal. I am very excited about both proposals. I'll st take one step back um, before I go on. I think it's fantastic that these folks. Um, uh, with both components who are Ferndale residents want to invest in the downtown and this is incredibly exciting uh, and leads into a, a, a longer term vision for the city and the downtown because I mean these are big projects and these are um, game changers in, in what's available downtown in many ways uh, but I too don't have a concern that we uh, would lose the character and nature of who we are in Ferndale from either of them, but particularly with the type of process we're talking about with, with extensive public input uh, and um, because it's who, and by nature of who we are. And that's what makes Ferndale attractive, I think, to so many 
to so many developers and businesses, and suddenly the economy is turning around to the point where this this kind of movement makes more sense. So I think that's that's exciting, and I'm confident that we can continue to be Ferndale before, during, and after all of this process and transition. Um, however, tied to the 18 months, I do what I don't see addressed in these agreements, and maybe it's a document outside of that. But I think we need to be very clear about milestones through this process, whether we say it's six, 12, or 18 months. Um, and, 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 and of course, we'll touch base throughout this process as we go. But I think that we need to have some discussion um, as well at some point about if at six or eight months or wherever we're at in there that we feel um, that things aren't progressing on either side as perhaps we thought we would. What are our options there at that point? Or, or how do we know before it's the end of the agreement that we have something um, in the exclusivity agreement that we have something that may not work. Where, where's the the pressure valve in that process? So, so we're touching base, but in a really organized and measured fashion. What are those metrics so that we should look at through this? Um, I think that's a really important component that needs to be a part of this, um, because it, it it would be I think a uh, waste on all parties' times that if we get to month twelve or six or eighteen or whatever, and we find up oh, we didn't make it, and we could have headed this off six eight months ago. Um, staff, I would say. To both comments about the time and the, the benchmarks, we would agree. Eight, Eighteen months is, is maybe a, a little long, and, and actually, I think for either project, six months is a little short, um, probably, to, to get to the point where we're comfortable either with development agreements or planned unit development agreements to have those approval in hand would be our goal. Um, my quick take is, is is to get those benchmarks. Uh, that's exactly why we're here tonight: is, is to start that discussion with one group as to what that's going to be and what that's going to look like. As, as to where it should be, um, earlier uh, on the agenda we talked about a development agreement. Mm -hmm. And I, my opinion, and I would defer to the city attorney, is if, if whoever we do work with exclusively, that one of the next steps would be a development agreement that could set those those benchmarks um, for the development going forward. And I would defer to Dan to, to, to comment if he thinks that's appropriate. Well, I mean, just, just on that issue, uh, certainly that's one place they could be, or they could be in this proposed uh, exclusivity provision, which mm -hmm. has benchmarks right there. Uh, and in the event certain steps aren't met, then uh, the city or either party uh, would be able to exercise and back out of the proposal. So, well, so let me agreement ask is one thing, but that, that's pro in all likelihood going to be down the road prior to that being completed and developed. Mm -hmm. uh, and if council is concerned with uh, making sure that everything is on track and consistent with its vision, uh, perhaps uh, issues along those lines of exit strategy should be inc incorporated into the uh, exclusivity provision with, with either party. I, I do have a, a suggestion and question, or a suggestion, and I'm going to be looking for it. Um, and it may not happen before we, we sign the development agreement, but I am looking for an analysis of entitlements, particularly if we're giving away land for very low cost or we're getting a brownfield incentive by the state. So, you know, I think it would be helpful if council considered hiring a, a qualified technical expert to review their numbers, particularly if they are getting incentives. Um, and you can't get an incentive from the state MEDC or else, you know, the state agencies without putting all your cards on the table. And for me, while, you know, we're here to make sure that we're, we're, these projects meet the vision of, of, of the downtown, at the end of the day, we got to make sure the city is getting a balanced and reasonable deal, that we're not going to get hosed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <laughs> so, you know, I have a healthy appreciation for developers. You're here to make a profit. You're, you're here to make a return on investment. They're not a nonprofit. Um, but at the end of the day, balanced and reasonable deal is what I'm looking for. So um, so uh, an analysis of an outside technical expert, particularly with the office space, because we need to make sure that, you know, that can be, that you can bring in the tenants for, for your second and third stage um, technology companies. That's the real risky part here, I think, of this development project. And I don't think that's, you know, no secret. Jake, Jake, I'm going to ask you that. I'm piggybacking on what Councilwoman Piana said. Um, describe just a little bit about what a second stage technology company is, why you think they, that, what your connection to those folks are, and why you, I mean, because there is a glut of otherwise um, 
Class A office space, and, and this is something different, right? And so talk a little bit about your vision of the office space, which does make your your proposal uniquely different than, than the other. Right. Well, I mean, it really comes down to a balance. So um, uh, first, uh, addressing what a second stage company is. These are companies that are um, later, uh, second stage being later on in their business. So usually when you have a startup like, like my company in 2008, it's, you know, a few people in a guest bedroom, maybe in a garage getting started. Uh, they usually would receive angel capital, usually under a million dollars, and with some state matching funds, then they move into a Series A financing round. Once you get to about two to three million dollars in revenue, which we were at after about three years in our business, you become what's considered second stage. So these are companies that are posed for growth. These are the companies that create the most jobs within our tech sector, and these are also companies that um, service the larger the larger tech industries, so the automotive industry around here, or the financial tech communities. So what we've seen within the second stage, these are companies that are post Series A. They're usually doing uh, debt financing or mezzanine financing, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of growth in these businesses. And the challenge they have, it's not finding office space. I mean, you could find office space in Troy. It's it's finding uh, finding talent and finding jobs, and it's getting families to come back. So you know, one of the things that I mentioned is about keeping talent here. One of the biggest draws in, in the conversations that I have within the tech industry, and in my industry, it's the Consumer Electronics Association, is is getting people back. So if you're if you're working a job and you know you're in your um, you know 30s, you're you're married and you're having a family, at some point you're going to want to come back where, where your grandparents are at. And, and that's one of the big pulls for these second stage businesses that are hiring. So startups and incubation, that's there. There's a place for that. That's not what um, I think Ferndale needs, per se. I mean, Tech Town uh, has that in Midtown. There's Automation Alley and Arbor Spark for those types of businesses. But for uh, companies that have 50 to 150 employees, those are the second stage companies that are growing, that have job vacancies, that are looking for affordable housing, and they need to acquire talent that are looking for that, that overall package. So, uh, it, and it I'm is, guessing these are well-paying jobs. Yes. I mean, the average salary for someone coming out of college is upwards of $100,000 in the software field. And, and uh, that's, a, that's a significant challenge, even hiring those people right here in Metro Detroit. So we've had great success at Livio, uh, now part of Ford, hiring those folks, and, and we sell Ferndale. You know, I'm not from Michigan. I grew up in Ohio. I lived in Florida. I lived in New England. And when I moved here, I, I chose Ferndale because of the package, because of the overall value. And arguably, you could say there's a similar thing in Royal Oak, but there isn't the feel, and there isn't that, you know, personality that you get from this community. And second stage companies can uh, provide extensive growth. So, you know, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have a, um, like a Google or an Apple or a Tesla be an anchor tenant for one of these positions. But I speak to so many CEOs and, and so many directors of larger corporations that are saying, you know, we need uh, space in the Metro Detroit area to acquire top talent. And second stage companies that are looking to grow, they're saying, you know, they, they need affordable office space, but they need to hire this, this talent. So for me, it's not so much about the second stage companies, it's about creating jobs. And that's what, that's what this is all about. You create jobs, you have the right people down here. That's how you grow it. And, and Ferndale is, is ripe for, for that opportunity. Thank you. I have a question. Um, the demand is there now, today, I understand that, but if approved, this process is going to take quite some, some time. You'd look at two to three years at the minimum for people to be able to move into these offices. Can you guarantee that the demand is going to be there in two to three years? No, there's no guarantees. And, you know, anyone that told you there was a guarantee just wouldn't be uh, being honest or they're not well educated. So it, you have to believe in it. And, you know, that's what makes second stage companies and startups thrive. And that's what makes this country great for innovation is just believing in it. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, the, the plus sides of this, and, you know, speaking from, you know, working with, with large automakers, now part of Ford, but working with GM and, and alike, is that it takes a few years to get the technology in cars. And in healthcare, it takes many years to get through the right approvals. So the decisions that are being made today, you don't know what this is going to look like 10 years down the road, but a, a decision that's made today from an automotive manufacturer is valid for at least three to five years. So uh, that mitigates quite a bit of the risk. And um, I just want to say on record that, you know, from an exclusivity perspective, you know, we want to be getting started as soon as possible, and I'm sure any developer would. Nobody wants to sit on this and, and just take, take resources. So I, I know that for, uh, from a timing perspective, we want to be going as fast as possible. And, and part of the reason that, that I chose this development team 
for uh, this idea that I started on a year and a half ago was that we had the capability to uh, bring in companies now and put them uh, in places now as we build this project out. So we wouldn't just, just like you guys want to sit around and wait for you know, 18 months to see what happens, we wouldn't want to sit around for 18 months and say, oh, great, we're ready to build. Let's start talking to people. I mean, that wouldn't be uh, productive for anybody. Are, are you comfortable if we condense the 18 months? How, how, where would you start getting uncomfortable? Well, that's uh, the question I really would want to defer to Dennis on. All right. The 18 months is meant to keep momentum and success. We wrote a cover letter um, to you, again, echoing what uh, Jake said. We would like to go as quickly and keep a rhythm to make smart moves and smart design. I'm going to step back and think and tip some of the program of, of what I've done with 360. You know, the office component is meant to um, be defensively diverse, if that makes sense, where I've recommended and the development team agrees with you know, three buildings with varying floor plates, you know, from 30,000 feet to 20,000 feet to 10,000 feet. So that's a kind of a, a market mix of office space that if tech changes, healthcare changes, you could find that being filled with a whole host of business types. It could be financial services, it could be legal, um, it could be accounting, um, it could be tech, it could be incubator on a single floor, um, it could be shared office space like a Regis or the like. So that's my job to be technically defensive on the plan. Um, the timing is simply you look at the approval calendar for municipality. Um, and that's when you actually can start showing drawings. It could be 60 days on the early side to have a um, representative set, depending on what the requirements are for the municipality to have a planning commission approval. Um, if we're talking about public outreach, which I agree with, um, you know, Jake is in town. He's going to get would you know hopefully get reached out to all the time, <laughs> you know, for those type of discussions. So it's meant to keep. A momentum and a success. Checkpoints, we love the idea because it actually makes sure that you're keeping up with us, frankly. Um, so 18 months is a success schedule, 12 months. Um, it, it could be acceptable, I believe, as long as we have a provision that everything is keeping momentum. What if we need an extra three or four or five months? Maybe an a acceptable extension provision. And you're going to know whether we're getting along, whether this is something that's we're simpatico or we're at odds. And you know, in this marketplace, in this development team, they have options. And you know, they're sought after for suburban urban. And they're busy, but this is something that they believe in. So again, you'll know 12 months as long as there's a provision. Hopefully, it can go faster. But I just really haven't seen a project of this scale go quicker than 12 months. Derek, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I do, I do for time frame, especially from a city staff point. Um, just, just having dealt with large-scale projects and, and PUDs before in the past, uh, 12 months is aggressive for either project. Uh, if we are shooting for planning commission approvals at the end of that window, um, I would have no problem with either project being a 12-month window with checkpoints. And, and we're, we're excited to you know, start talking to either group about what those checkpoints are because they'll look different depending on which direction we go in. Um, but I would ask that either one of them have the ability to extend beyond that if we've made acceptable progress with the projects um, and that that be included in there. I think mm -hmm. that's a, a pretty simple, mutually agreeable set of language that we could, we could work out. Um, Twelve months will go fast um, when you're talking about this type of project environmental. I would assume both projects would have involvement from the MEDC, uh, multiple boards and commissions of the city, meeting schedules, plan review. It, it, that 12 months is aggressive for either project. I know it seems like a long time to lock up these, these properties, but um, any development uh, of this size or scale is going to take at least at least that long to get the initial planning commission approvals. If I may, through the chair, yeah. um, I, I, I would be personally more comfortable with a 12-month with that option to extend, so at least we're coming back and having that conversation. Yeah. I acknowledge the the difficulty of it, but I mean, on our side, in all fairness, we have to put in enough time for public input, make sure we're doing the right things and due diligence on our side, um, and cultivating that good partnership. I, you know, we don't want to be prohibitively difficult about this. We want to be good partners. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the, I, I would much rather have that 
kind of hard stop at 12 months with the option to at least have the discussion at that point if we need to go so we know why. We know that there aren't other in here. And it goes back to the milestone discussion, right? We want to know if there's a problem not at month 18, at much earlier. We have no problem with that as staff. That's fine. Other comments, questions? The, the other point I didn't get to, um, I just wanted to throw out there uh, as well, is, and we, we've kind of alluded to this, but during this time frame, doing the exclusivity agreement as part of our due diligence, um, I think it's important to emphasize that um, there is a transition planning activity as well. So before we break ground, and this is where partnership with, I think, the DDA and, mm -hmm. and other entities are important to say that, yeah, we have a plan for businesses that during this disruption of construction, we know how we're going to keep uh, you know Ferndale accessible we know how we're going to you know keep uh, folks in business and and work with them hand in hand so it's very clear and deliberate and um, we're very open and communicative about the fact that yes there's a plan as much as we're doing before we've got something in place to make sure that um, that that our current businesses are uh, supported through this process so and I think that's a another outcome or metric that we've got in place that before this period is done we've got an acceptable plan in place to help execute that Dan, huh. just to follow up on that I kind of see that as a continuation of the public participation plan it may not come out right away um, in the upfront part of this conversation until we understand what the footprint of the building sure will be like I, I um, but I really think it's important I agree. Yeah, no, I think the public participation is, is critical and feeds into that. Um, I mean, it's things like, uh, and I, yeah, and I think it's things like, where do we put the cars while construction is going yeah, on? Exactly. You know, right. Right. It, it's going to be huge. The communications with our business owners is going to be huge. And the other audience is going to be the residents most immediately impacted, the ones that live sure. on Withington, the ones that live on Troy, how big, you know, and where do they get to be, have input in the process is going to be critical on those two groups in particular. And I just wanted to say, you know, the DDA had um, on their PowerPoint tonight the city and the DDA teamwork, and so I expect that's how it's going to be on this project. A fabulous opportunity yes. to exercise. <laughs> well, and I mean, speaking of that, um, oh, Mike, did you want to? Mike, is it, Mike has the chair of the DDA board. Uh, just a, a quick comment. Well, well, my, the DDA is excited about that. both uh, plans in here, but uh, we don't really see a picture or, or um, yeah. a, a layout or a, a, a design yet. And I heard uh, the number of 150, 100 to 150 um, employees for a business uh, and, and 100 uh, residential units. Do they have uh, numbers for the property? Uh, how many parking spaces and surplus spaces? Dan, uh, I mean, Derek, I'm going to let you... Field that one. We, we, yeah, we, we've certainly talked, uh, and I think it's a city center project. Uh, Mr. Wolfson has had uh, some more time in front of council in the past, yeah. uh, dealing with specifics and, and conceptual designs. We've certainly talked about concepts with the other project. Um, both of them provide a considerable amount of parking. I think the city center one was uh, four stories and, and uh, approximately 100 residential units. Um, the, the other project is, is a considerable amount more parking just because of the size and scale of it, and it deals with the Troy lot as well. Um, we don't have as many details. We're, we are not ready um, at yeah. this to point start, to talk yeah. about specific right. numbers for any projects. Right. We, are, we are nowhere near that point with either of them. Um, depending on which direction council goes, those are the first things we're going to start to go through and meet with residents and business owners about is specifically what we think can be supported and, 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 and specifically what that design will look like. But we're, we're not ready to talk about that tonight. So speaking of the DDA, I mean, it was so clear, and that wasn't timed this way, but in their presentation tonight when they talk about the goals of, uh, that the DDA has, you know, they talked about uh, encouraging mixed use, especially as it relates to office. And, and, and office is important in my perspective to this project because it bring, the best thing we could do to help our retailers during the day is bring more foot traffic during the day. So these are people with high incomes that are going to be here during the day, not when our parking is at its most maxed out. So these are folks that conceivably would go home at night or maybe walk to a club but won't need an additional parking space. So office is a critical component of this to me and what, what makes the 360 development worth pursuing. But you talk about increased parking and you talk about increased density and more residential. What's, what's, what's interesting and, and, and exciting about the 360 project is it's exciting to have developers, frankly, wanting to do any of those components. 
Uh, I'm glad that we finally reached that day. Uh, but to have all of those pieces in one project is almost overwhelming and ex incredibly exciting. I think it probably makes it a more complex and maybe difficult project to put together. It probably does require more time than, than, a, than a, a smaller project. Um, I am grateful that Bob is here because Bob's development right across the street has been a catalyst for the development that's happened on the east side of Nine Mile. And frankly, I think if it wasn't for the fact that all of these components had come together in one project, we'd probably be, in my, for me, I'd sit here and vote to, to move ahead with that, that project. Um, but the office component, I think, is what separates them for me. Uh, uh, I don't know enough. I'm not a realtor or, or in the high-tech business, so I don't know with certainty that there's enough tenants to do it. But I think that the opportunity is, is, is so exciting to, to sort of transform the downtown and especially transform what happens during the day downtown, that it's worth us exploring that. So that would, that my, my I'm going to vote tonight for the 360 Ferndale project. But I want to say that I'm, I'm really grateful that we have two frankly outstanding projects from developers that know their business better than I do and would either either one would be um, a great addition to our town. Um, we have to do this right. This is just the first step of a lot of steps to go. Um, but that's that's where I'm at. I do have a couple specific questions then about the exclusive negotiating rights agreement that would that's been drafted with 360 um, and Dan Chris maybe this or maybe this I don't know if this is a Dan question or a Derek question but there's a couple of places in here where it references a good faith deposit is there a deposit deposit that's required with this agreement and if, and if not if so what is it and if not why is that in here I know it's on page five the very first line it's there I think I saw it one other place as well but we're not to my understanding we weren't talking about a deposit no, I think that's an earlier draft. Uh, which, which page are you looking really? at? Really? I'm, I'm looking at page five, the very first line. What section is We're it? talking about re remedies. So section 4.6B, oh. remedies. Yeah, that is. There's no 4.6B. That, that is an earlier yeah. draft that you're looking at. So do I have an old draft? You I, must have an old one. Wow. Well, I, you you like I would love that one. All right. And what, so I will also tell you what drew me to that section, and this I think is a Dan question. Um, oh, there's, these are like totally different now. So. <laughs> um, wow, I really do have an old agreement. So that's a problem. Um, the good faith negotiations, my question initially was, I'm sure there's a legal definition for what constitutes good faith negotiations, and I would like you to tell me a little bit about what that is, but I will say my... my assuming that in this draft is similar to this draft, the remedy was simply that um, the, the developer's sole remedy is to terminate this agreement. Correct. So Correct. the city, even if we didn't operate in good faith, and I know that we will, uh, the remedy wouldn't be any sort of financial penalty to the city. But talk to me a little bit about what, what it means to negotiate in good faith from a well, legal perspective. Well, I mean, that is a term of art. Typically, that would mean, you know, a, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonable person uh, negotiating uh, to try and achieve a certain outcome. And the outcome is set forth in the recital is, uh, if possible, to come to a uh, agreement uh, with respect to, uh, for the one, uh, for, for the uh, uh, proposal by 360, uh, to come together with uh, a, an agreement on a mixed-use uh, office and public parking uh, plan. Uh, so... It, it, the, the fallback is what a reasonable person would construe as good faith. Uh, there's no okay. framework with respect to exactly what that means, uh, but you're right, uh, Your Honor, that uh, with respect to the uh, default provision, it would uh, allow for uh, 360 if it determines or, or uh, believes that the city is not exercising any good faith, that it, it could walk from the agreement. Right. And similarly, uh, it would provide a remedy for the city if it, it thought 360 uh, wasn't uh, acting in good faith or, or as a reasonable uh, negotiating partner should, that uh, the city could uh, elect to try and terminate the agreement. But good faith is not not meeting benchmarks. No, because there's no benchmarks that are set because forth are no in, the, in the agreement. Set forth. So six months comes, and I mean, and, and I assume this is you know, we're going to be working closely with either developer. So, well, but, but to the extent that there are specific <coughs> marks that you have in mind, yeah. 
uh, it would be preferable for those to be in the uh, document because those aren't uh, subjective. Uh, they are objective. And uh, so if there's something that you have in mind uh, with particularity, that would be something that could be put in right. the document. Hmm. I, well, so it gets back to this notion of these benchmarks. I'm not sure they need to be in here or not, but I – I hear you say that you're as anxious to have some measures along the way as we are and that everybody seems to agree that we ought to be able to know at three, six, nine months how we're doing. Um, um, I, what is our remedy if we get to six months and we're not meeting our benchmarks? Um, I guess I'm almost, now I won't ask that from a legal perspective, but I'll ask that to the developers. How, how You guys have done these projects before. I mean, um, yeah, please. What we've advocated and it's been successful in the past is if it's, you know, a 12, 15, 18 month agreement, is every three months the developer comes back in the public forum and reports where they are. And that's really the best, a very good faith, you know, expression. You're going to get public comment, you know, to say this is the progress we've made. Um, it'll be apparent to you if, if it's moving forward, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The, the alternative would yeah. be to say site plan approval by X date, yeah. you know, which has more particular, you know, it's more specific. Yeah. But that may not be reasonable to have those dates at this point in time. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that it is. That's the I trouble. Say, if we get just a point, I, I do think to get a a PUD approval, which is short of a site plan, is going to take a year, probably, to go through that whole process. Um, I, I do think that with either project, I would conservatively say a year, I, I would be very comfortable, or, or, or I think that the larger project may take a little longer than that to get the actual PUD approval, um, which subsequently formal site plans come in after that. Um, I, do, I know uh, the, the city center project proposed six months, we may be able to get a PUD done in six months. If we had the PUD agreement in front of us right now, just the public hearing process takes 90 days. If we were starting to notice that right now for planning commission approval. So that, that gives you an idea of the time frame. If I had the agreement in front of me, it would probably be, with the city attorney's recommendation, it would be 90 days before it was in front of you. Okay. And, and we're nowhere near that point with either project right now. Um, so a, a PUD approval at the end of a year, I think, is an is a aggressive uh, time frame. I don't know how many specific benchmarks related to development you guys would want to see, other than updates every maybe every 90 days. I think that's a, a fantastic suggestion for either, either project. Um, and then maybe at that point there can be a discussion and, and some ability to opt out if, if everybody's not happy. Right. But, just to, just to add my two cents on that. So I, I, yes, and I, I trust, Derek, that you hear council's um, desire for the benchmarks. Certainly. Mr. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to add a few things uh, before you vote. Um, uh, I think there have been great comments tonight by the public and by the council, and I appreciate, you know, the thought that's gone into this because I think these are, this is helpful for the community as well as to evaluate the projects. Uh, we've been involved with a number of public partner uh, redevelopments uh, between the communities. And I, I just, I think the, the a, a couple points that were made I just want to reiterate um, and expand upon. One of them was from Councilwoman Piana about the, you know, the sort of the studies and stuff like that, which I think is a very good idea and something that should be really um, looked at very carefully because we, I've uh, been involved with one development in particular um, in the city of Canton where we uh, developed Cherry Hill Village. I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with that, but they wanted to create a new downtown in the city of Canton. And uh, we built apartments and a, a performing arts center um, that was attached to apartments. Some pictures are in your package. But uh, it was the idea to create, um, you know, a new downtown there. And there was a lot of uh, commentary by the public um, uh, people in the public as well as the, the, the people involved in there about wanting certain mixed use um, uses that weren't feasible, some of which we were able to, um, and being in the business, we understood what we could do, some of which was not feasible, some of which 
uh, uh, we ended up just agreeing to do the development. And I think it's, it's very prudent upon your part to analyze the feasibility of these things because you don't want to end up with vacant space or development that doesn't work after, you know, 12 months or 18 months. And I think you'll be able to consider that very quickly once you understand the proposed the uh, structure of the deal as well. So I think that would be very good um, because we don't want to see another failed project, um, whoever ends up doing that. And um, so that was uh, one thing I, 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 I appreciated you saying that, and, and I think that would be a good thing to be added in any of it. The other reason why we thought six months would we propose is we felt within six months we could we either would have an idea if this is moving forward or not in terms of the scope. We fully understand that a PUD, and I agree with Derek's comment, would take a year, and I'm not trying to negotiate against myself. Right. But realistically, right. that, you know, to get into the ground is going to take some time. However, working with all the different agencies that are involved, you know, whatever types of conditions that are set forth on the project, you should be able to iron out most of that stuff in six months. And I think, you know, uh, you want to consider that, you know, the environment you're in in terms of the interest rates um, and where you're going. And it's, you know, I, I agree with um, uh, the other party by saying that, you know, I, I think everybody's motivated to get this going right away. So that's why I propose that. And just, and just lastly, I do want to comment on one thing that I heard because I was involved with uh, redevelopment in Miami. Um, in an area called Midtown Miami, which is right near the design district, and I have some photos in that. And usually what happens, in my experience, um, you know, with some of these sort of incubator jobs and stuff like that, and is, you know, that they come and they, they fill up space that's existing right away. And they may not be able to accommodate, you know, the large goals in the future. And I think that thinking forward in terms of the trend is good because these developments take you know, one, two, three years. But what we see on the ground is a lot of vacancies. And, you know, you could take 50 or 100 people and fill them in to retail vacant spaces or office spaces and stuff in the area and say, look, at, we're here now and we want to expand. I don't see where those uses are and uh, where those employees are. So I just wanted to comment on that because when I was redeveloping in Miami, you know, you saw warehouses in our districts and designers and stuff that were already there in place. So anyways, I, thank you. I just wanted to say that. Uh, yeah. If I may, I would like to okay. follow up. Um, I, I do appreciate you acknowledging uh, the, the importance of an analysis of entitlements, but I also want to know that I proposed it to council when Mr. Wolfson came to us in 2010. So <laughs> I wanted to do analysis on his development project too. When you've got public property on the line and public incentives, you need to make sure, again, you're getting a balanced and reasonable deal. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for me, it's one of my interests of this project that we, we do that. All right. Other Questions or comments? And, and I'm just going to conclude mine by saying that um, I also support the 12-month 12, 12 with, a, with a provision to, to extend if necessary. Well, I'm going to, if there's no more questions, I'm going to take a shot at doing a Can motion? I make one more statement sure. before we go? Uh, just going back to our discussion Sorry, about me, benchmarks, there is a clause here, Section 2.2, that talks about upon request we can ask for the financials or what have you. I don't think you, we have to go crazy around benchmarks necessarily. You know what I mean? So that, again, it's not about nitpicking anything or, or whatever. But I think there are, um, and I'm not an expert of it, you should be in this agreement or outside of it, but I think that is that would be an example of a reasonable benchmark to make sure the financial feasibility is there. You know what I mean? To make oh, that kind oh, of yeah. request. We, we certainly believe in, in the agreement. This agreement, the development agreement, will require them to provide any information either Planning Commission or City Council wants at any time to demonstrate that the project is But I'm, I'm just saying, suggesting from a benchmark perspective, we come up with a... Uh, uh, a system to uh, for both sides to monitor and look at it to say, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing that's there. You know what I mean? Are there leases signed? That kind of stuff. I mean, there's different things that I don't think that from a broad sense that we could we can build into an agreement that talks about what those thresholds are or what those benchmarks are. So we have points of conversation when you come back every three months to give us updates. I mean, you know, so they're clear what we're looking for. So a motion doesn't preclude further discussion, by oh, the way. I'm sorry, no, I'm just trying to finish up. No, yeah, no, ab no absolutely. But I, have um, I, I just want to uh, thank both developers for coming forward. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Derek and his department for doing all the work uh, to date and bringing this to us. Um, I... Um, 
it, I think both both plan ooh, both <laughs> plans are very good, um, but to me, young people are interested in in new spaces and and new technology, and that's going to drive the young people, the young entrepreneurs, to Ferndale. Um, if if young techies wanted to move to Ferndale, the Ferndale Center building would be filled with them. Uh, the thing is, is they don't want 20-year-old wiring in a building. They want new tech, and they want to live and work in the same near or close to the same space. Um, so that's one of my um, uh, reasons for supporting the 360 program. Um, but whichever plan works, I hope that the the, de the development group that didn't receive support tonight will consider, you know, looking at another space in Ferndale because those two two plots are not the only ones that could support redevelopment. So. Councilman Lennon. As been asked and stated, I just don't speak up quick enough. <laughs> so just move on. All right. All right. All right, I tried. I'm, I'm gonna try to do a motion here, but please, if we need to do friendly amendments. But I'm not going to put the benchmarks in the motion, right? That's agreed upon? Okay. I move that city council authorizes uh, the mayor, city attorney, and staff to finalize and execute the exclusive no negotiating rights agreement with 360 Ferndale LLC for a period of 12 months with the option to extend based off of mutually agreed parameters. Would that be? May I offer an alternative? Yes. Instead of mutually agreed parameters, which I don't have a problem with the language, but I think just a more functionality base would be sure. to extend for a period not to exceed 12 months unless otherwise approved by council. So basically, you're basically by putting that 12 month deadline in there, you actually have to come back and say, oh, we're extending or we're not. Correct. Okay, I get it. Yeah. I'm good with that. All right, that is a motion. Is there a support for that motion? Support. All right, further discussion. That doesn't end the discussion. Any questions that the, anyone in the audience has thought of while you were sitting there want, listening? I just think this is the right direction for our downtown. I think it is about placemaking. It's about attracting entrepreneurs. It's about increasing... Uh, the number of families in our downtown and giving different choices for people to live is exactly what we've been trying to do for the last 10 years and we finally have projects to help us fulfill that vision. I'd also like to reiterate, I'd again, I'm incredibly grateful for both parties um, and their uh, offer to, to come in and I think um, um, that, the, I mean, I think what tips the the tips me towards the towards 360 is that I think that the, the office component of it is just too compelling not to explore um, and that's why I think we, we should go down that road but it's not for lack of genuine thanks and interest in, in, in other parties and and hopefully there's um, you know more business we can do together in the future are we ready to vote Sherlyn would you call the roll please Council members Martin? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Tiana? Yes. Lennon? Yeah. Mayor Coulter? Yes. Thank you. That item is adopted. I, I just would like to, first of all, say thank you. And then I would like to also extend my thanks to, to Bob and, and Sam um, from Best Act, especially. And I would like to say it, the office component is the reason staff made the. We understand the difficulty with it. We understand uh, how that impacts the project and, and makes it more complex. We'd like to hope that uh, Sam and Bob stay interested either in other parcels in the city and or if, if this goes backwards and the office component ceases to be a part of it or isn't workable, um, we hope they can consider coming back and, and take a look at their project again. Uh, again, Bob has done a lot of good, or Mr. Wilson's done a lot of uh, nice things in the city. The project across the street is exactly what um, he said it would be. Uh, when he proposed it years ago. And <coughs> if this project significantly changes, we hope they consider coming back and, and talking to us again either about one of these parcels or another one in the city. So thank you. All right. Uh, next item of business is call to council. Police Chief Collins, anything for the good of the, of the city this evening? All right. Jen Jenny, uh, anything from HR this evening? No, Chief Sullivan, anything from the fire department to see? Well, I got it. Nothing this. All right. Um, Joe, anything from the Chief Innovation Officer this evening? Wow. Lloyd, anything from DPW this evening? 
keep hang on to your show shovel. Jill, anything else from the recreation department? This what? Nothing else. All right. Wow, you're all shy tonight. I'm Sherilyn. Anything from the city clerk's office? I'm sorry, nothing. Wow. No, April, anything from the city manager's sure. office? Sure. Let's burst the bubble just a little bit. All here. right. Mm -hmm. um, very briefly, I wanted to give council an update on where we are with Hazel Park as it relates to the fire authority. As we come up on um, budget hearings and budget workshops over the course of the next few weeks, yes. I just wanted to let everybody know that um, the fire authority uh, conversation with Hazel Park is somewhat stalled at this point. Um, they have significant um, um, concerns that they have within their own community and their millages and where they are currently with their finances and they need more time to figure out how all of that works together. Um, the door isn't closed by any means but um, unfortunately we have to as a city of Ferndale have to continue to move forward with what would it look like without an authority. So um, at this time I think our, our conversations have stalled. I don't believe the doors are closed um, but Chief Sullivan and I are going to have to work toward um, how will this fire department look if we do, if we do not have a fire authority. So I know that Hazel Park will um, continue to work through um, what their needs are and so will the city of Ferndale as well as we'll be looking at other opportunities uh, to partner with other communities and, and with, with Hazel Park as time moves on. So again, the door isn't closed, but at this point, we, uh, Kevin and I feel that as we bring forward I, that thoughts and ideas as it relates to how we're going to fund our fire department and what our fire department will look like in the budget, um, we're going to proceed um, without the authority part of that, but but know that we're still in conversation and still um, to neighbors with Hazel Park as they try to figure out what it is that their millage requirements are as well. So um, we just felt that at this point we need to start moving forward and figuring out our plan of action so that we aren't standing there holding a, a budget that we can't support. So I just wanted to let council know where we are and, and that we'll continue to move forward the best way possible. So when you talk about bringing us forward options, um, is that through the budget process since this obviously has an impact on, sure. on the yeah, budget? Sure, yeah, I mean, the, we'll start with the budget process. Uh, Kevin and I, sorry, Chief Sullivan and I may not be complete by the time the budget process since that starts next week. Yes, it um, does. But we will be um, continually providing alternatives and we're working through that right now as well as meeting with our fire union to try to, to see what, what some options are. I think we have some great ideas that we've already been kind of working through knowing that this might not necessarily necessarily work out so I would imagine at the budget uh, workshops will be having multiple conversations on um, fire service and moving forward as well as as you know uh, our Headley is almost expiring is actually in the next couple of years so we'll have to provide alternatives for that as well and if this budget process is going to lay the groundwork for where we're moving forward um, and, and helping a good basis for those conversations. So I think it's going to be a bigger conversation, but we have an immediate need for this next fiscal year that we'll be working through. Yeah. Anything else? No, that's enough. And then, uh, Dan, Chris, anything from the legal perspective? Uh, just one item, Your Honor, uh, kind of related, but uh, the council is aware of the city's, uh, the provision of the Michigan Constitution regarding the city not lending its credit. Uh, there has been a joint resolution passed by the Senate and House uh, asking that uh, the question of an amendment to the Michigan Constitution uh, be provided to sec to add an additional uh, section to Article 7, which would allow the cities uh, to give away its property where there's a determination of no use or, or public purpose. It's something that's going to be followed. It's probably going to come to the electors of the state uh, in November. Oh. Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martin. I do. Uh, the Ferndale Community Foundation grant season is upon us, and grant applications are available on our website, www.ferndalecommunityfoundation.org. Um, we are awarding grants up to $2,500. Uh, and so if the, the application's online, as is my phone number, if there's any questions or concerns, um, we have extended the date to April 18th for submission. That's it. Excellent. Councilman Lennon. Nada. Nada. Councilman Pollicott. Well, uh, Ms. Butters took care of the FEF dinner. Uh, Mary Schusterbauer talked about CFF Good Neighbors Awards. <laughs> Mr. Martin uh, talked about the FCF grant. So all I have is make sure you have your street clean. Uh, if you have a sewer in front of your, your home, make sure it's cleaned off so that the street doesn't back up because a lot of debris is now getting caught up in those drains. And again, I reiterate, put things on pallets or in plastic bins in your basements because the ground has not thawed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Piana. Yes, I have a couple. Um, 
I want to announce the Chamber of Commerce Rainbow Run. Um, registration is open now for the run, which is uh, a 5K on Saturday, May 31st. If you want to uh, have your neighbors throw colored powdered paint at you while you run and with your uh, citizens of Ferndale, it's a great opportunity. I did it last year, um, and I walked run because I hate running, but I did it anyway because it was a... a a good thing, uh, good fundraiser. So the Chamber of Commerce is raising money for local nonprofits, and there are many other runs going on in other communities of similar type themes. So make sure you register at rainbow-run.com. And early bird registration is March 30th, and uh, you'll save five bucks if you register by then. Um, I wanted to announce the Dales Neighborhood Group is having its first happy hour at the Emory. Um, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, so come meet your neighbors if you uh, um, haven't met them before. And it's very kid-friendly, so um, bring the kids. And then I have a suggestion for staff. Um, I got a couple questions um, from uh, homeowners about how to prepare for their board of review meeting, and they asked me for advice. And um, I had to do a quick Google search to find uh, how to prepare evidence and put your case together. And I thought it would be helpful as a customer service is have something on our website about how to prepare for your board of review. Um, I haven't checked out the Oakland County website because it's down right now. And it's been down for a couple hours. So I'm not it's sure. Power if they, outage. Yeah, it's back up. Yeah, I'm not sure if they, have, they, if they provide yeah. that type of um, amenity. Um, but I think that would be very helpful for our residents who have chose to go to the board of review. Um, and then my final note, which I forgot to say during the development proposal, is that the mayor is always saying we, he wants to make Ferndale um, a great place to start a business, and I think we're all on board with that. But from my urban planning background, I've always wanted to make Ferndale a great place to do development um, and be a great partner. Um, that is a, a different type of position and, you know, and, and looking at your processes and and your, and your strategies internally and your customer service. And so um, developers certainly know if it's difficult to do development in a city, um, they take the risk whether to go down that path or not. And I'm very pleased that we have developers choosing Ferndale um, because I like to believe um, it is easy to do development in Ferndale as well as start a business. That's right. I, I do think that, these, that this development shows the confidence that people have in our community as a place to be successful. I hope it also reflects that they think it is a, a, a friendly place to do business, and I hope it's a very successful place to do business. Uh, I only have one announcement tonight, and that is that the Chamber of Commerce every year sponsors the Mayor's State of the City Address, and they have uh, announced that this year's State of the City Address will be Tuesday, March 25th, um, at the Rust Belt Market, so that should be a fun venue to do the State of the City Address at. Uh, the speech is at 7 o'clock, and there's no charge. If you want to come to the Chamber's uh, reception before that, there's a $15 reception that starts at 5.30, uh, where you can talk to our department heads and meet folks and staff and just and meet with the Chamber. But there's no charge to come to the speech, which is at 7 o'clock. Uh, and now I just have to start writing it. So uh, with that, I'll adjourn the meeting so I can go home. Good night. <laughs>